Good afternoon, Council. Thank you for coming in uh, early today so that we could uh, get through this uh, agenda. Um, if it's some incentive, I'd like to tell you that there's, there's um, this meeting and then there's, I believe, a planning public meeting next week and then our final council meeting in June and then we get a month off, hopefully. <laughs> Fingers crossed, as long as nothing comes up. So looking forward to a bit of a, a, bit of a break. But uh, I'd like to declare this meeting now open and uh, ask you to turn off or down or silence your uh, electronic devices and uh, let you know that public comments made during this meeting are audio and video recorded. And if anybody's live streaming us, I'd like to say welcome um, for the first part of the special council meeting and to let you know that the town's retention bylaw can be um, seen by the clerk at the clerk's office and uh, that's how we retain our records is in accordance with that bylaw. So with that, um, there is open forum, which means I'm on the wrong agenda. So it is uh, the recommendation for approval of the agenda for the special council meeting moved by Councillor Isis and seconded by Councillor Arsati. Any agenda repair required? None. All in favor? Contrary? That's carried. Is there any disclosure of pecuniary interest or disclosure of interest? Seeing none. Next is the uh, appointment of a chair and uh, for the in services and in power uh, annual general meeting. Uh, the recommendation is that the deputy mayor be appointed chair as the uh, mayor. On, I am a, on the board of InPower, so um, that would be my conflict, I guess, which I should be. Um, I'm going to ask the clerk that now because do, did I de do I declare a conflict on that piece or do I simply just not chair that piece? I'm trying to remember what Mayor Walkup did when I chaired. I believe the, the former mayor did sit, stay at the table, but it was just chaired by the deputy. Thank you for that. So a mover and a seconder to, uh, that would be Councillor Nickel and Councillor Van Burkle, that the uh, deputy mayor be appointed as chair for this section. All those in favor? Everybody's, everybody's in favor, but the deputy. <laughs> okay, that's carried. And would you like to move seats, Dan, are you? You're good there? Okay. Just give me the gavel. Here you go. <laughs> Gavel's yours. Thank you. Mr. Chair, um, <clears throat> so I'm, I'm pleased to introduce uh, the uh, president and CEO of uh, it's starting to get hard to count, actually, the number of companies uh, that Wally uh, has responsibility for, uh, but uh, he'll take you through the presentation uh, for tonight, and then there's a series of uh, resolutions related to that. Um, Mr. Chair, there are a number of resolutions, I, I believe, including the appointment of the uh, the directors or the confirmation of the directors. I may be wrong, the clerks can correct me, uh, but the uh, DEC, the presentation has addresses all of those issues, I believe, so uh, happy to take your lead, but we can go through the presentation if you want and uh, have the resolutions afterwards. So let's move forward with the presentation, then we'll move forward on our decisions, okay? Thank you. In power, we'll start with that organization first. The board of directors currently as municipal representative is Jason Rayner as CAO, Lynn Dolan as mayor, independent directors Robert Lake, and independent director George Chaparro. The four members, and we'll get into the board governance uh, at the end of this presentation for in power and talk about what's happening in regards to board governance and the board of directors. Also like to introduce the Empower executive team, uh, myself as president and CEO, Danny Prasad as the chief, chief operating officer, Shannon Brown is our vice president of corporate services, 
Glenn McAllister is our Chief Financial Officer, and Barb Cesarin is our HR Manager and Board Secretary. Part of the uh, annual AGM is to appoint the auditor. Uh, our recommendation through the Board of Directors is that KPMG is reappointed as Empower's auditors to hold office until the close of the next annual general meeting in 2020. In regards to the electricity rates from January 1, 2018 to January 1, 2019, with a customer, a residential customer using 750 kilowatt hours per month, they have seen a decrease in their electricity rates from 2018 to 2019. We're very pleased and happy to report this to the shareholder as well as to our customers that the rates have decreased over a number of years where they were increasing. As a reminder, this is uh, where the dollar is spent in regards to on your electricity bill. The right hand side shows how InPower invests the 30 cents. So for every dollar we collect from the bill, 30 cents is collected on behalf of InPower to use for our operations. I'd like to call up our CFO to go over the financial statements summary for you. Good evening. Um, I'm gonna be going through the financial statements at a, um, a high level of the changes and such. Um, I believe you all have received copies of the audited financials, so if there are specific questions either later this evening or at a later date, please feel free to uh, send me an email and I can go through them. So um, on the assets, um, current assets, uh, there wasn't a major change. Current assets is your cash, your uh, accounts receivable, prepaids, et cetera. Um, and then we have, there's, there's a section in there which is the regulatory um, deferral variance accounts. So the, the regulatory deferral variance accounts are the accounts that we use, there are regulatory accounts that we use to catch mainly timing differences between uh, that when we purchase power from the grid and when we sell it to uh, our customers. So they are all, you'll see they are on our tariff sheet and then those are the, uh, when we talk about the RSVAs or the DVAs, those are the, the uh, accounts that we get permission from the OEB to dispose of at, uh, at our cost of services or at our annual uh, IRMs. Uh, liabilities, so there was an increase in long-term liabilities. The majority of the increase was due to uh, long-term debt, which we use to finance our capital. Uh, as well, we received uh, contributions in aid of construction. The long-term debt increase was about 1.7 million and the uh, contributions was 1.4 million. So contributions in aid of construction are those amounts which are paid against our capital by third parties, either developers, uh, individual homeowners, builders, et cetera. You will see there was a fairly substantial increase in the uh, shareholders' equity from 17 to 18. Uh, in 2018, we had net income of 2.4 million versus 2017 of 35,000. The increase of the net income is for a couple of reasons. Uh, first, we filed a rate application for rates effective January 1st, 2017. That was filed in 2016. Uh, due to a number of delays, we did not receive that rate increase until uh, May of 2018. So that accounts for a fairly substantial portion of the increase. Um, second, there's been a, a number of changes in management and we've done some uh, reviews of how we account for things and record and basically general operations. And we were able to identify a number of items which previously were expensed which should have gone to uh, capital as opposed to expense. So, um, uh, where am I, sorry. So that mainly accounts for, uh, for labor and materials, which again, previously were hit the, uh, the OM&A and now are going to capital. 
And third, uh, which you will see when we get to the uh, expenses, is even though there was a delay in the, the rate application, in power did a very good job of uh, maintaining our operating expenses. We were not sure what our rate increase was going to be for 17 or 18, and at the end of 2018, we were able to maintain an increase of about $160,000 on our OM&As. So that was based on uh, revenue projections from 2016. So on the revenue, you'll see the major portion there, which is electricity sales. That is the amount that InPower collects on behalf of the IESO, Hydro One. Uh, basically, anybody who um, pays their hydro bill, um, the vast majority of it that we collect, we pay to somebody else. As uh, Mr. Malcolm said, we get to keep 30 cents. The other 70 cents is basically in that uh, electricity sales. Um, again, you'll see our electricity distribution revenue increased, and that was because uh, in 2018, we received our rate increase. In 2017, we were still running with rates that were effective from 2017. So, and again, from the expenses uh, overall, um, we were able to maintain a fairly tight rein on our, uh, on our expenses. So, which is something that we are working very hard to do because we do recognize that uh, our rates are up there. So, you know, maintaining and, and uh, keeping tight control of the expenses is uh, one of our best ways of making sure that we can maintain uh, our distribution rates without having uh, significant spikes going into the future. And then uh, capital. So our total capital program for 2018, the gross capital was uh, $5.7 million. Um, and of that, we received, uh, sorry, I can't see that far, but um, uh, capital contributions, again, from um, uh, mainly developers of, uh, I believe it was about two and a half or $3 million. So the net amount capitalized was 2.9. So in, in the capital, we do earn a rate of return on the capital, which is why you have gross capital, which is the gross spend, and then the net capital, which is what actually gets into rate base. So customer growth, we are Innisfil, uh, and sorry, InPower, which is Innisfil and uh, Southbury, is among, if not the uh, fastest growing from a uh, electricity standpoint. Um, we have been growing at about 4% for the last number of years, 4% uh, customer annual growth. Currently, that is 4% in uh, Innisfil proper. Uh, the South Barry lands have not yet really started to develop, although they are, they are now. There are shovels in the ground. There are buildings started to, uh, to be constructed. So, you know, starting late 2019, early 2020, we'll see uh, our growth should start to go up even more so than the 4% if, uh, if Innisfil keeps going where it is and South Barry. So um, we've been talking for a number of years about the growth is coming and can pretty handily say the growth is here. The shovels are in the ground. The buildings are starting to go up. It's not green field anymore. It's all been stripped. So this is something that we have been planning for for, uh, for a number of years. Um, millions of dollars worth of capital to feed that lands, and uh, we are f fully prepared, fully ready, which uh, Danny can get into, but fully prepared, fully ready to supply those lands with uh, the electricity necessary. Uh, a couple of our key performance indicators. So on the left, the profitability, you'll see that in 2017, we were not very profitable, and that was uh, basically a direct result of not receiving our, uh, our rate increase. Um, in 2018, with that rate increase, we were able to have a very healthy uh, rate of return, um, just over uh, 11%. So we are now, now on track and for the future, um, making sure that, you know, in power is the best utility that it, uh, that it can be profitable and then working towards reducing our rates for our ratepayers. 
Uh, and as you can see from the cost efficiency in 2017 and 18, uh, both our cost per customer and our cost per kill for, uh, per megawatt hour dropped significantly. So um, this is the this is the start the start of I'll call it the new Empower. So um, we're very happy, very excited um, to take these into our next cost of service application. So now I'll pass it over to uh, Danny Prasad, who's the Chief Operating Officer, and he can go through the capital. Thank you, Glenn. Good evening, everyone. So uh, I'll be walking you through a few sections, um, I, just to give you a bit of, um, of what's going on in my world, so the engineering and operations end. I'll go through the capital. Sorry, Mr. The, Chair, if I could interject for just one second. <clears throat> because of the length of the presentation, if there are questions related to, for example, the financials of InPower, uh, it, it may be uh, more expeditious if those questions come as, as part of those, uh, after those slides, because uh, we're going to do all three companies together. Uh, so if there are any questions, uh, if that's okay, Danny, sure. uh, for Glenn, related to the financials, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, this, would be, this would be a good time. Any questions from council at this time? Okay, thank you. Great. Okay. Um, so the, the sections I'll be going through are the capital projects update to just give you an, give you an idea of, um, of where we're spending our capital dollars. I'll give you an update on our long-term system plan and our strategy for meeting the growth that, uh, that Glenn mentioned. Um, and I'll go through a little bit about uh, rate making and and how we come up with our rates and how we set our rates in order to recover the money required to build capital. So a little bit about our capital pro projects. Um, I wanted to go through before we got into it, uh, just a little bit of an education. We have five major capital classes or areas that we invest our money in, in order to generate a rate of return. Those are system access investments, system expansion investments, system renewal investments, system service investments, and general plant. Most of you will be familiar with general plant investments. Those are your property, plant, and equipment assets that allow you to run your business. In the electrical utility business, there are the others. So system access is basically any asset that we put into service that allows customers access to electricity. So that includes building any new circuits. That includes re, um, relocating existing circuits. Uh, and then there's system expansion projects, system expansion investments, which are expanding the distribution system. So you'd be most, most familiar with that in subdivisions. So when subdivision's going, it's an expansion of our distribution system. There are system renewal investments that replace, renew, or refurbish existing assets. So that allows us to not have to build brand new assets, but refurbish and maintain the life of existing. Finally, we also have system service. That would be our stations. So power gets to us at a certain high voltage level. Right now it's 44,000 volts. We have to transform that voltage down into a usable voltage, um, typically 27,600, 27, uh, 8,320, and 4,160, I believe. So that, uh, that's the kind of investments that go into system service. They're station related, they're the fault indicators, they're the uh, automation, protection and control type investments. This is a summary of some of our major projects that we've started and constructed over the last year. The reason why I went through the investment group is that I put that on the, the column to the side so that you can, you can get a look and get an idea of where we're investing our dollars you'll be able to see that a lot of those are system access related projects and those are for the new growth and development that's happening in, in, in Innisfil and South Barry. So you can see some of the major projects that we've constructed are the IBR and Young relocation, Maple View Drive at the 25th, um, Six Line and 400 and 89 and 400. And the last two were part of the MTO projects for the highway and the first one was from the County of Simcoe. And we'll be extending that County of Simcoe project. As you can see, the intersections under construction right now, we'll be extending our pole line rebuild going east this year. 
We're also doing a lot of major station improvements. With this significant growth that we're about to see, we need to be prepared now. Stations are a long-term asset, and we can't build it in the year that we require it. We need to pre-build and take a look at that. So what we've done is we've taken three of our core stations that are gonna be feeding a lot of the growth that's expected to happen, and we are essentially putting in larger transformers, rebuilding the station to ensure that the reliability of that station is maintained. You'll see that a number of projects that we're looking at this year center around the 25th side road as well. So we are planning in the next two weeks to have an open house in uh, the Sandy Cove area where we, we, where we will be going through a number of these projects, what they're all about, and showing to the public uh, what the final result would look like and to also get the public's input. We have also Metrolink's Go Rail Electrification that's coming through with the, uh, with the, the Go Station that's about to, um, to come to Innisfil. The Metrolink's is also looking at electrifying all of the tracks. And so what that means for us is we don't have any overhead lines that will travel across the tracks. So right now we're in detailed engineering. We've done the geotechnical to, uh, to analyze what it looks like underground so that we can do a jack and bore to bury those conductors. So what that means in layman's terms is that all of our crossings will be underground and it'll be clean and beautiful. We're also looking at various subdivision and intersection street light improvements. We've noticed that there's a lot of dark spots here in Innisfil. We've been working with the town to investigate um, improving those, those areas by putting in street lights. Some of them have no electrical power near them, some intersections, and so we've been looking at either look, uh, solar solutions or building additional lines to service that. You'll see when we look at Enterprises, which is our third-party affiliate, we're also looking at offering streetlight services to the town as part of the one town, one team structure. We're also doing various pole, transformer, recloser, replacements and improvements. As I mentioned last year, if anybody uh, was watching, reclosers are required to open and close the line temporarily in order to prevent a larger fault from happening. Last year, you might remember, we had a number of flickering light issues. Those flickering light issues were a result of, of problem equipment that we weren't able to easily find. Putting these improvements in place allows us to readily identify those locations and get them resolved. I'll be going through the long-term system plan as well, as I mentioned. Uh, should we pause for questions on the capital projects? Any questions from members of council? Okay, thanks. I think we're okay at this time. Great, thank you. Okay, so for the long-term system plan, uh, we've mentioned that over the next 15 years, we're gonna be seeing significant amount of growth. Estimates indicate that close to 25,000 new homes are gonna be here in the next 15 years. And that results in 85 MVA of peak power. So MVA is basically a, a quantity of power measurement. It's the multiplication of voltage times current. So uh, the typical home would probably consume about one and a half kilowatt hours. If you multiply that by one hour, your home has used one and a half kilowatts, okay? Uh, the, next, the next scale of measurement is a megawatt and which is equivalent to an MVA for all intents and purposes for residential. So that's the scale of what we're looking at in terms of power. On top of that, this new residential growth is likely to bring industrial, commercial, and institutional loads, which will add another 90 megawatts, or MVA of peak power. So securing this long-term supply is going to be required to prepare for this growth because as I mentioned before, the supply that comes into Innisfil right now is at 44,000 volts. That supply is not gonna last very long. What we need is supply at a higher voltage level. A higher voltage level ensures that we have more capacity 
because we, it requires less current in order to operate at that kind of a voltage level, which means we can cram more electrons in at that voltage level. So you'll be seeing that we have a plan in place to meet that growth, and I'll be presenting that. However, I'll, I'll preface that with a caveat. It's still early. There's a lot of moving targets, as you'll see. We have developer construction schedules that change. We have the regulatory and political agendas that change. And we have finance and engineering and construction timeframes that change. So this strategy that we present tonight is one of the many possible approaches that we're investigating. I'll skip ahead to this one because I think this slide kind of gives you a high level of what we're looking at. The lines in red right now are at 230,000 volts. These are the big giant transmission lines that look like transformer transformers. We have SATS, which is at the very center of all of those lines, and that is a network station. The green line that egresses out of that box is at 115,000 volts. You can see that goes into Barry, and then there's a red line that comes into Innisfil. That red line that comes into Innisfil with the little box at Innisfil doesn't exist today, but that's what we need to get to. As part of this project, it'll be in four parts. The first part is converting that green line into red. That would mean going from 115,000 volts to 230,000 volts in order to increase capacity to the Barry Innisfil subregion. Furthermore, we have to build at 230,000 volts a line that comes from Barry all the way down to Innisfil in order to build the Innisfil or South Barry TS. We haven't come up with a name yet. So, those are the four projects that we're proposing. That's what it looks like. We have to replace the auto transformers at ESSA, rebuild ESSA to Barry, rebuild Barry, rebuild Barry to Empower transmission line, and build the Empower TS. Those are the timelines for construction. This is going to be a very long project. We're looking at a 25 year time frame. The costs are as presented you'll see that the highest of those costs are to build the TS, and those are the proposed financing funding sources that we're looking at. As part of the transmission system code, it allows the constructor, who in this case will be Hydro One, Hydro One operates our transmission system in Ontario, to construct and finance these projects. We have applied to the OEB for a 15-year term that will start in 2022 for items one and two, as well as a 15 year term that will start in 2025 for item number three. When we first started this project, we were not going to be the only ones to share this cost. We were to share this cost with Electra, and Electra has since withdrawn their support due to unmaterialized growth. So that leaves in power with the entire bill for this. However, I'll caveat that again by saying that within 15 years, there's something called a capital contribution refund period. If Electra or any other proponent decides to use electricity from our improvements, we get a refund. So within 15 years, if the growth does materialize, we get a refund in Electra service territory. Furthermore to that, we have Metrolinx that is planning to build the Allendale traction power substation. If and when they connect to the 230,000 volt line, we also get a refund. Okay. <clears throat> I'll also note that if you look at the last point there, we're looking at alternative financing and ownership for the transformer station to mitigate some of that cost as well as looking at non-wire solution. So we've, we've been reaching out to a number of uh, battery providers to look at potentially having uh, battery storage where we would purchase at night and then expend during the day. That allows us to build a smaller TS that is more modular and looks really good for the town. 
looking at the costs, I've taken, I've taken the costs of all four of these projects that you see here, 10 million, 3 million, 13 million, and 37 million. And I've assumed an interest rate of 4%, and I've plugged it in over 25 years. And you'll see that the highest amount is in years 2025 to 2036. It goes just over 4.5 million. Currently, 4.4 million annually is our approved net annual capital spend from the Ontario Energy Board. So what this, what this essentially means is that what we're, what we're showing here is not, we're, we're not gonna have a rate spike. The likelihood of having a rate spike is low. What we plan over time is for that $4.4 million, which today is attributed to distribution capital costs in the, in the five capital investment areas that I mentioned, to be transferred into supply capital costs to get this strategy going. We'll also be applying in 20, for, tw for new rates effective 2022, where we will explore the option of a custom rate application. What that means for us is that we would come up with the strategies for keeping our rates sustainable and go to the OEB with that strategy to see if it's something that we, they would be interested in approving. That puts us in, uh, that, put, that's put, that puts in power in control of how we mitigate a rate spike. Over time, as the number of customers increase, this cost is also spread over a larger group, as you can see, uh, which means a lower unit cost per customer. So that also helps. <clears throat> so as I mentioned, two factor, these two factors should result in a sustainable rate increase and not a rate spike. Let's see. Any questions? Any questions from member council? Donna, Councillor Sadi. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Just on the strategy for the financing, um, you know, trying to think of uh, the costs of the uh, transfer stations, it mentions there the uh, financing, alternative financing, and ownership options. Can you give me an example of an ownership option that you would be alluding to here? Through you, Mr. Chair. What we would be looking at in this solution would be for the constructor, let's say in this case being Hydro One, who would be constructing the transmission lines to potentially own this station as well. And so that would take it off of InPower's balance sheet, but we're not sure about costs, if it would be a higher cost to pay that. That's something we would be exploring. Yes, Councillor. Thank you. Follow up. Then, um, and I know that you'll present on this before uh, later, much in the future. Um, then, would something like that ownership option, if say Hydro One was, uh, you know, one of the ones that uh, was willing to to have that ownership option, does that then mean a shared revenue stream? Because if you own that, you you want some payback for that. Through you, Mr. Chair. Having, having another utility own the asset means that we do not obtain a rate of return on our capital investment. That capital investment becomes somebody else's investment. And we would also be having to continue to pay transmission related type costs because again, we do not own the asset. If we own the transformer station, then we are buying power at bulk. We would not be buying true Hydro One. We would essentially, for lack of a better term, cut out the middleman if we were to do it ourselves. Thank you. Sorry, and just um, uh, previously presented before was that we're fully ready to supply the lands for Barry Innisville lands. Um, and, but now this is looking at the transfer station that would be required to service those annex lands that Barry has, correct? 
Through you, Mr. Chair, we're able to meet the short and midterm needs without the transformer station. Mm -hmm. The transformer station is required um, for the growth that will materialize within the next 15 years. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Water. Uh, thank you. Uh, could you explain what unmaterialized growth is on Electra's part and what that was due to? Through you, Mr. Chair. I, I can't speak on behalf of Electra about that. What I can, what I can tell you <coughs> is Electra Service Territory is in the city of Barrie, and I believe that they had mentioned that they did not see the amount of growth that they expected in the city of Barrie. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question. If for some perceived possibility there was a, a situation where um, there was another power source that we could purchase power from um, and negotiate a really good rate with that particular industry per se, um, has InPower looked at that and how it, we could use it to actually reduce further rates for our uh, residents of Innisfil? Have you looked at that possibility of it existing? InPower, ha InPower will be looking at a lot of possibilities going forward. This is just, as I mentioned, this is just one option that we've presented. We are open to looking at alternative options in the future. And I'm just asking from a council point of view is that would we use this benefit to offset any cost increases to our residents? Like I said, it's something we will look at and we will explore. Um, in, in my opinion, it's, it's better to keep the assets in the town in order to get the required return and profitability on your investment. Okay, thank you. Any further questions or I think you can proceed. Right. So I'll talk a little bit about utility financing and rate making. So the utility business, we've tried to keep it a bit simple. Basically we build assets, we earn a rate of return on our assets and we pay our operating, maintenance, and administrative expenses. That's how we earn money and that's how we stay in business. <clears throat> the simplified unit distribution rate that we charge our customers, you can basically think of it as our revenue requirement plus our return on capital investment divided by the customer base. So all distribution rates are approved by the Ontario Energy Board in a legal process of complex review including negotiation and settlement. Empower doesn't set any rates. It all has to be approved by the Ontario Energy Board. And it all starts with the revenue requirement. This is the baseline for the five-year cycle I'm about to describe. As you can see from the, from the pie chart, we take all of our costs in our various areas, administration, regulatory, maintenance, operating, we group it all together and that becomes our revenue requirement. If we take that revenue requirement now and we take it to the Ontario Energy Board and between years two to five, the Ontario Energy Board offers us something called an incentive rate mechanism. That's basically an inflationary cost increase subtracted and what you subtract from that is any sort of productivity improvements that you should have taken. So what it, encourages, what it encourages the utility to do is become more and more efficient over time in order to get a larger rate increase. So you can see the elapsed timeline from submission to the OEB to the final decision and order for the IRM, you're looking at four months. It takes about 75 sheets and three mandatory OEB models to do that. So where is InPower in the five-year cycle? You can see InPower is at year three right now, entering into year four of the incremental rate mechanism, incentive rate mechanism, pardon me. It all starts with the cost of service in year one, goes through the five-year cycle, then hits the cost of service again. A cost of service is basically a rebasing. You look at your entire rate base. 
So years five and year one overlap as, present, as preparation for the next cost of service commences. Uh, what's important to note in this slide is that rates are officially set in your cost of service year and you get a formulaic increase year over year up until your next cost of service. So why is that important? It means, again, the utility can't set rates individually in any year. It means you have to go to a cost of service hearing in order to set your rates. In the case of any sort of merger and amalgamation, as you recently mentioned, rates can't be set immediately. Things can't happen immediately. So what ends up happening is utilities can apply for a deferral on their rate base, in which case they hold their rates at a certain rate level up until they're able to apply into the OEB to get their rates changed. Utilities under merger situations have seen that go as long as 10 years before any rate increase changes. And at that point in time, it's unlikely to know if your rates are gonna be high or if they're gonna be low. So addressing major capital requirements. Again, in power will be facing enormous growth from infrastructure and load perspective. Um, the principles of the return on capital, they're calculated on a five-year cycle. And we would be looking again at a custom rate application for this. This would give us approved rates for 10-year timeframes. In terms of financing and capital funding, we wanted to point out that Empower operates like any other business. We use debt and equity for capital. We strive to maintain a 60-40 debt equity ratio in order to remain properly leveraged. And typical lenders include financial institutions and Infrastructure Ontario, other government sources. <clears throat> a utility is not a going concern and it is highly regulated. As the number of customers and load increases relative to cost, so does the viability of this business. I'll pass it back to Wally through the rest. Thank you. Any questions on the previous mm -hmm. slides? No. So in power board governance, uh, previously this year, you looked at the in services board governance document the document was also transferred over to InPower as well as Enterprises. So the InPower Board of Governance is exactly the same as what you've seen on the in-services document. The only exceptions in the document is, that, of course, the name of the corporation from in-services to InPower. Our regulating bodies are the Ministry of Energy and the Ontario Energy Board as opposed to the Ministry of Environment. So what we're asking at uh, this meeting as well as part of the resolution is to approve that Board of Governance for InPower. The Board Governance, similar to InServices, uh, calls for five members sitting on the Board of uh, Directors and with two of the five to be municipal representatives, one the CAO of the Town of Innisfil and the other one is the Mayor of the Town of Innisfil. The other three would be independents. And with in-services, we'd be working with the clerk's department in order to set up a nominating committee, receive nominations for the board, and then have the nominating committee strike as to who would be on those particular boards. Not sure if there was any questions on the board governance itself. Councillor Sadi. One quick question on the independent director. Can they um, apply to rerun uh, for that position? Through the chair, yes. Uh, an independent director can reapply for another three-year term. Any other questions? I just want to remind council, we have three meetings to go through before seven o'clock tonight. So if we can just keep our questions focused, we'll be all right. Thank you. Bye. So now we'll move on to in-services annual general meeting.
Board of Directors, Municipal Representative is the CAO of the town. Independent Director, Mark, Mark Aiken, who is also the CAO of the County of Simcoe. And the Independent Director is George, George Chaparro. All of these terms were appointed January of 2018 in an interim role until the Board of Directors slate has been finalized. The In Services Executive Team is myself as President and CEO. Glenn McAllister is the Interim Chief Financial Officer. Zahir Mohammed as Manager of Utilities Operations and Tom Panic as our Manager of Utilities Engineering. As with InPower, we are recommending that KPMG is reappointed as In Services Auditors to hold office until the close of the next AGM in 2020. I'll ask uh, Glenn to quickly go over the assets and uh, liabilities on the in-services. So again, I'll take it at a, um, a high level and in the interest of time. Um, so on the assets, the major increase in assets this year is uh, capital. Uh, in-services is very capital intensive. So we have at uh, the year end of uh, December 18, approximately $60 million sitting in WIP due to a number of uh, long-term multi-year projects, such as the Lakeshore Water uh, Treatment Plant, the Listec Project, and Lafroy Servicing. On liabilities, the increase in, uh, in liabilities ties in pretty close to the increase in uh, long-term assets. The majority of the increase is in the, our uh, contributions. So uh, currently the uh, water treatment plant um, is being uh, funded through an agreement with Bradford. So um, we've received, we receive funding from Bradford at the moment to pay for the uh, water treatment plant expansion. And as well, we receive uh, contributions like same as the town does when they uh, assume subdivisions that have been uh, been completed and assumed by the municipality. Uh, revenues. So uh, we saw over 2017 an increase in revenue of approximately $2 million. We have seen, in services has seen customer growth on the water side by, uh, we increased by 980 customers, which is roughly 10%. And uh, on the wastewater side, 960 customers, which is roughly 12% uh, customer growth. So we are currently working on a new uh, water wastewater rate study, which will be done sometime this year and we'll be using for the 2020 budget. On the expense side, um, we've seen a number of changes on, uh, on the expenses. A lot of this is due to, the, uh, to assuming new assets, such as uh, Friday Harbor, where there were uh, booster stations, pumping stations, uh, which we previously did not have, as well as uh, reservoirs and the water treatment plant. One of the major changes is the, uh, there's been some decrease in the cost of operations of the water treatment plant due from the, uh, the change to the uh, membrane type filter, which uh, requires uh, less backwashing and as such less, uh, less water usage. Uh, on the capital, uh, as I mentioned, in services is very capital intensive. Um, the majority of our projects are, are multi-year, not one and two, but sometimes three, four, and five years. So the uh, they sit in our, uh, they do sit on the balance sheet, but they sit in uh, in WIP for uh, for a number of years. In 2019, we do have a number of projects which are nearing the end of uh, their construction phase and will be transferred from WIP into uh, capital. And the majority of the funding for capital assets comes from development charges. So at the moment, the majority of our assets are growth related. Um, this just shows, as you can see, customer growth for water and wastewater both continue to, uh, continue to grow in Innisfil. And then, um, um, KPIs, so the, uh, the big one is the, the profitability. So again, as uh, the original rate study was done by the town prior to the creation of in-services, and there was certain um, factors built into that in order to 
similar to the town, you guys uh, create reserves. In services doesn't have reserves per se, but we do have increased uh, revenue from operations, which are used, which we do set aside, similar to a reserve, and those are used to fund our uh, replacement capital uh, that we're, or, sorry, used to fund the capital that will need to be replaced in the future. So now we, uh, into capital. So the major capital you've seen at uh, the last quarterly meeting. So Excuse we'll me, start. I just have a question from Councillor Waters. <laughs> Thank you. Um, a question on how you allocate some of your ex revenue and expenses, both in in-power and in, in services. Um, I, I was looking at the charts and on your revenue side, your base categories are basically the same, you know, the distribution other and other sales. Uh, but on the expense side, they're quite dramatically different in terms of how you categorize your expenses. Um, so on, on in-services, you're, you're looking at wastewater collection, wastewater treatment, pumping, and, but the other uh, for in-power is uh, administration, operation, and maintenance. So are there no operation maintenance in in-services, no administration costs? So where are those being covered up and so, why the uh, difference? Yeah, through, through you, Mr. Chair. On, when in-services was, without getting too, too detailed, when in-services was created, there, there are four distinct operations um, to in-services. There's water treatment, uh, water distribution, wastewater collection, wastewater treatment. So when the accounting structure was set up, basically everything related to each of those four operations was put into those buckets. So instead of having um, as in-powered as operations, maintenance, uh, administration, the operations, maintenance, and administration for water treatment are all in the water treatment expense. So it's, it's just a different different grouping, and that's the way that the accounting structure was set up. So we, we are looking at, we are in the middle of changing the accounting structure, and if, to be able to provide that type of breakdown is something that I can't do very easily today based on the accounting structure, but with the new accounting structure, it could be uh, similar to the way in powers are shown. Okay, it just makes it difficult to compare how things are, are, com are comparable. Yeah. Okay, thank you. That's it. So the major capital overview I won't go over. It was at the last uh, quarterly update that we provided to Council. So the summary of major, major projects, similar to what was presented at the quarterly update. The projects awarded in 2019, similar to what was at the quarterly update. Board of Directors recruitment, so the recruitment for the Board of Directors is in conjunction with the Clerk's Office, as I mentioned, so we'll work through that process through in-services as well as in-power at the same time. Uh, any questions on in-services? Any questions of Council? We're good? Okay, thank you. Now we'll move to Enterprises. Board of Directors, two Board of Directors right now, both Municipal Representatives, the Town CAO and the Town Mayor and they stay as uh, appointed on the Board of Directors while holding their respective offices. The Enterprises executive team is myself, Danny Prasad, and Glenn McAllister as the Interim Chief Financial Officer. Uh, the assets, uh, it's pretty straightforward. It's a small company uh, with uh, small revenues and small expenses, so I won't go through the details of those assets. Liabilities, uh, same uh, scenario. Revenues, looking at the different revenues, so communications, Sentinel Lights, uh, other revenues that we obtain by doing other services. Pretty straightforward for a company this size. Expenses, the same thing. Again, uh, resolution is required for KPMG to be reappointed as in, power, as in serve enterprises, sorry for the typo, uh, auditors to hold office until the close of the next general meeting in 2020. Uh, the Enterprises Business Strategy Update, just to give you a quick snapshot as to where we're at with our strategy. The whole intent of this company is to look at different opportunities to uh, have uh, businesses located within Innisfil that provides a revenue stream for the town of Innisfil. This company is the one that does the innovative, creative uh, workings and rounds looking at competitive businesses that we need to get into. 
So we talked about the cell towers and the, the movement on the cell towers throughout. Rogers is leasing on space of three existing cell towers. We are in continuous contact with the other uh, carriers to have them uh, join on our towers as well. Internet service is one that is uh, a key topic for the town of Innisfil as well as the residents here. Looking at partnering up with the town to look at internet service alternatives for the residents of Innisfil and also looking at subsidizing free local Wi-Fi for the town. Power engineering and operations, we uh, brought this up during the orientation presentation of looking at power line construction, locator and inspector services. We're still awaiting the legal and tax opinion uh, for this type of strategy uh, before we uh, move forward with it. Control room services, we have met, met with a number of utilities, smaller utilities that do not have a control room service and gauging their interest in setting up uh, us as a provider of their services for them. Streetlight design, installation and maintenance, we are working with the Town of Innisfil staff to look at the completion of designs for street lighting as well as the maintenance of the street lights within the Town of Innisfil. Power generation and storage, uh, ongoing research on battery storage. We've met with a few companies in regards to battery storage. Uh, it looks very promising and an opportunity for us here at the Town of Innisfil. Uh, EV car charges, we have applied to Natural Resources Canada for funding for two level three chargers, that's the high speed DC chargers, to be located uh, within proximity of the 400. So the application has gone in. If we are approved, that will subsidize 50% of the cost for those EV chargers uh, that we've applied for. Sentinel lights and other investments, it's ongoing. We're reviewing the street, the Sentinel lightings themselves. It's more for farm lanes and commercial areas. Some of the commercial areas, they want to set up different lighting to uh, ensure safety uh, at their parking lots. So does it make sense for our company to do it or does it make sense for the commercial entity to take it over and redesign for their requirements? Again, we're still waiting on tax and legal advice for some of the plans that we've already discussed with council. Once we obtain that, we'll develop the strategy and the business plan and bring it back to the board as well as to council for your approval. The Enterprises Board Governance, again, mirrors exactly the same as in services and in power. The exception is the name of the corporation. In the board governance, it identifies five board members, but based on the current size of enterprises, it was recommended through our board that only two members remain on this company until it increases in size, and the two members would still be the two municipal representatives. Any questions? Starting off with you. Your Worship, please. Thank you. Uh, just a, a comment about the cell towers, which I think is a pretty exciting opportunity. I've heard a lot of complaints from folks around Sandy Cove about cell yep. phone reception. So um, just to, to I, I talked about finishing that project Q3 or Q4, and to have uh, some kind of a, a communication go out to let people know that, uh, that these towers are there. Um, well, not trying to promote one company over another, but just to allow them to understand this is new and these are the companies that are on there so that people can, can make a decision about who their provider is. Yeah, and for Sandy Cove, since we'll be having a community session with them in regards to the 25th, that'll be a great opportunity to advise them where we are with the cell tower uh, project and keep them up to date as to where we're at. Okay, I think Councillor Waters. Thank you very much. Uh, two questions. Um, in my ward, I have a few residents who are Wi-Fi sensitive, and uh, they've gone to great lengths to uh, make sure that the tower cell, uh, cell, uh, cell towers are quite a distance from where residents are, especially children. And also on the local Wi-Fi, they're also, uh, they have no Wi-Fi inside their house, and in fact, past resident of who bought my old house was Wi-Fi sensitive. So just, are we, are we, do we know much about that? And if, given these residents an opportunity to express their concerns when these, when we go ahead with these would be kind of nice for them. Through the chair, excellent point. There are a number of folks that do have sensitivities to these types of wavelengths. Before we uh, move forward with any of those types of projects, it would be imperative for us to have a public consultation go over what our plan is and to meet with those individuals that do have the sensitivities to make sure how do we uh, assist in ensuring 
that uh, they're not faced with that type of wavelength. Excellent. Uh, question number two is the EV char chargers, which you mentioned for Highway 400, are there not already EV chargers in the parking there currently? At the uh, car lot, uh, the MTO, it's a uh, level two, which is a 240 based uh, charger. So it's your level one is your 120 that you have in your house. The next level is 240. That's what's at the carpool. Right. This one would be the high speed, which would be up to 50 kilowatts. So instead of charging up your car and taking four to six hours to charge up fully, this could charge it up within 45 minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, and following, proceed. That's all that I had for the uh, presentation. Thank you. And the recommendation? I need it here. Okay, I've got a uh, Councillor Fowler, Councillor Isis. And the recommendation that the, pre that the presentation regarding in services, in power, and enterprises be received, and that the audited financial statements for in services, utilities, Inc., in power corporation, and enterprises, Inc., for the period ending December 31st, 2018, be received as information, and that KPMG be appointed auditor for, auditor for fiscal year 2019 for In Services Utilities, Inc., and Empower Corporation and Enterprises, Inc. Corporation, and that the numeration be such, as such be fixed by the Board of Directors for each company. All in favor? Thank you. Need a mover and a seconder. Councillor Van Berkel, Councillor Isis, recommended that the interim board of directors for In Services Utilities Inc. be confirmed until the recruitment of board members is complete. Jason Rayner, director and chairman. George Shapiro, director. Mark Aiken, director. All in favor? Oh, I have a question from our CAO. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to comment, uh, Mr. Malcolm made a note of this, but I just wanted to underline uh, that you had originally appointed this interim board for a period of 18 months. Uh, I can assure you that none of those board members uh, would like to hold on to that position any longer than they have to. Uh, but given the regional review that's underway related to municipal services, uh, the recruitment is uh, commencing, but we are also anticipating that there may be some significant impacts as a result of the regional review, and so not uh, to bring new board members up to speed until we've heard uh, and as you know that's only a few months away uh, so uh, very interested in moving that along but uh, wanted to make sure you understood the delay thank you mr. chair thank you and so we need uh, all in favor thank you that's moved okay I need a mover and a seconder councillor Isis councillor McNichol <laughs> recommended that the minutes of the In Power Corporation annual general meeting and the Enterprise Inc. annual general meeting dated June 27, 2018 be received as presented. All in favor? Thank you. You give me a run here. <laughs> I need a mover and a seconder. Councillor Asadi and Councillor Waters recommended that the Board Governance and Recruitment Strategy for In Power Corporation and Enterprises, Inc. be approved. All in favor? That's carried. Thank you. Need a mover and a seconder. Councillor Fowler, Councillor Van Berkel. Uh, George Shapiro's term as Independent Director on the In Power Corporation Board of Directors be extended until the recruitment of board members is complete. All in favor? Thank you. Need a mover and a seconder. <laughs> Councillor Fowler, Councillor Waters. Recommended that Council reserve, resolve into closed session meeting to consider the following matter. A position, plan, procedure, criteria, or instruction to be, to be applied to any negotiations carried on or to be carried on by or on behalf of the municipality or local board. Section 2392K of the Municipality Act 2001, Lakeshore Water Pollution Control Plant, front end financing and interim allocation principles. All in favor? That's carried, thank you. Oh, Mr. Rayner, sorry. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to take the opportunity before we uh, resolve in, uh, well, before we move in camera uh, to thank very much uh, the Board of Directors who were able to attend uh, tonight and those who were not. Um, the, uh, they continue to provide significant guidance to this company as it uh, grows. I think we like to say from a teenager into a young adult, or maybe it's an adult to a wise old, anyway. Um, and uh, so we very much appreciate their continued support. Uh, I also want to thank the senior staff and the staff of uh, all of the companies. Uh, they continue to, uh, in, in quite uh, uncertain times, as uh, Mr. Prasad said, uh, with the regulatory regime changing, uh, it feels like daily, uh, they continue to, uh, to provide an excellent leadership for our community. Uh, the board uh, likes to say that um, we have our nose in their business, but our hands out. Uh, and uh, sometimes it feels like our hands are in, uh, but they do a very good job of uh, uh, being very uh, uh, diligent and vigilant uh, with the community dollars and the public uh, work that they do as utility companies. So I want to thank them very much uh, for their good work. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. I think your words are concurred by council. Um, our worship, yes, go ahead. Just also a quick comment that uh, last uh, week we uh, went through a three-hour training session with the Walkerton Clean Water Center, which I think was a, a great exercise, and it was shared with uh, staff of in-services and, and council members and, and just gave us the, um, I guess, the, the surety and also the gravity of the importance of providing clean water to the community and the efforts that it takes to do that. And as uh, I, I, I know a water operator who loves to say that he saves more lives than a doctor every day by uh, providing clean water for our community. So thank you on that respect. Okay, thank you. And I've actually, before I did make that meeting, however, I have been to Walkerton and I've been through the uh, small museum they have there and I've been through their wastewater treatment plant and such. So yeah, it's uh, made a huge impact in Ontario. There's another aspect there again. But anyhow, thank you very much and I think Councillor will move forward. So I appreciate your time tonight. Take care.
general council meeting. So I need a mover and a seconder to um, now rise and report at 7.03 p.m. That's moved by Deputy Mayor Davidson and seconded by Councillor Fowler. All those in favor? That is carried. Next is the recommendation for the confidential direction regarding the LWPC P. Moved by Councillor Nichol, seconded by Councillor Waters. All those in favor? That is carried. And the confirming bylaw, <coughs> Councillor Nichol, Councillor Van Berkel, all those in favor? <laughs> That's carried. And adjournment, <laughs> Councillor Nichol, Councillor Van Berkel, all those in favor? And that's carried. Thank you. So now we'll move to our, uh, our regular council meeting for this evening, the evening of June the 5th. And I will um, just open the meeting tonight um, with a couple of comments. Uh, the first one is I'd been asked by a few people uh, why the flags at the town are flying at half staff. And, uh, and I wanted to let you know the reason we've done that is uh, because of 11 people that were uh, killed and six others wounded in uh, Virginia Beach, Virginia on Friday afternoon in the case of a disgruntled uh, employee indiscriminately opening fire at the municipal center in Virginia Beach. And as horrifying as that is, What's equally horrifying is it hardly made the news cycle because it's become so normalized. So in, uh, in reference, uh, reverence for the families and those victims, um, we're respecting them by flying our flag at half mast today. And I'll also like to say, and oh no, I'll have to wait because he isn't here yet. I'll, I'll uh, take leave at council if you'll allow when the CAO arrives to, uh, to make another announcement. But before I do that, a very good, and now I just uh, was going to say, please put your phones on silent. So I'm some, that cue was to, uh, to, to tell people to do that. So phones or devices, please on silent or, or, um, or vibrate. And also to let you know that the public comments made here tonight by each of us are audio and video recorded and shall form part of the record, which is retained in accordance with the town's retention bylaw. And if you need more information about that bylaw, the clerk's office would be more than happy to assist you. So just before we go to open forum, uh, <laughs> my other announcement is that um, if the CAO looks like his, uh, he's a little sleep deprived, uh, that probably is the case. Uh, congratulations, uh, CAO Rayner, on becoming a new father this week. And uh, all the best wishes to you and your growing family. And um, I very much thank your wife for allowing you to be here with us tonight, being that uh, your young son is, is so young and, uh, and you're back here with us. But we appreciate your assistance. Thank you. So the first, we have two uh, open forum items tonight. And open forum is a chance for people to uh, speak to council on issues that uh, are on the agenda and that they'd like us to consider before making decisions on the agenda. So uh, now we also ask that you keep your comments to about two-ish minutes, if at all possible. And uh, the first one would be Bonnie Barth, and she wants to talk to us about the item, I believe it's on the correspondence list, G, which, was, um, which is the uh, staff report about the paddleboard business uh, at Leonard's Beach. Ms. Barth. Actually, sorry, if you wouldn't mind coming up to the microphone, uh, it, would be, it would be better for us and for the people who are online listening. There's one right over there. Therefore, you're both audio recorded, plus the people who are watching us online will hear your um, important words as well, whenever you're ready. Okay, good evening. Actually, I didn't know I was gonna speak tonight, but I have been sending numerous emails to our council, and um, I thank them for their time and consideration. Uh, I'm most concerned about the paddle boarding business uh, that is proposed or is coming to Leonard's Beach, the bottom of the tent line. Um, I'm all for water sports. I love water sports, anything to do with the water. Um, 
but what my, my friends and family are concerned about is the vast amount of space this is gonna take up on both the beach and in the parking lot, which is already compromised. Um, we have, it's not just a matter of one or two paddle boards being out at one time. Uh, they have markers out there set up and there are anywhere from, we've sat there and witnessed it, seven or eight paddle boarders up to 12 and they're going from almost from one end of the beach to the other. And it's in shallow water so that they can um, maneuver their paddle boards in the sand. So that's understandable, but it's just like, how is that going to look when the beach is crowded? And we've got several young children in that shallow water, as well as adults. We've got big boats tied up out there. It's, uh, it's really gonna compromise space and safety. I just can't see how that's gonna work in that, that small beach. And I'm wondering if there is a better spot for that, particularly at the end of uh, Lockhart, where there is a small stretch of beach, but it's rarely used for swimmers. Um, that might be a spot, or the north side of Innisfil Beach Park. Um, also, the parking is a huge issue at Leonard's Beach on any given day in the summer. Um, and there are, right now, seven or eight vehicles coming in from Barrie as part of that paddle group, paddle boarding group, and they've been issued some sort of um, slip from the town, I assume, from the town, um, allowing them to park there. And again, what's that gonna look like a couple months or a couple weeks from now when we finally get some hot weather? And that beach is packed. The parking lot is already a huge issue. Byla can back, back that up for me, I'm sure. They're, they're there constantly in the summer issuing tickets. Non-residents are parking there. And now we've got at least seven or eight more vehicles coming in that are not residents and they're taking up spots. And right now, as I'm sure other people that pay taxes to Innisfil can probably feel the same way, you know, when our tax money, mine is 4,100 a year, going to support parks and I can't get a parking spot at that beach, um, there's just something wrong with that, but Barry people can. So again, it's a safety issue, it's a parking issue. We've got sanitation problems and uh, with the porta potties and so on. So I just think that there, I'm not against paddle boarding, but there's gotta be a safer way to do this on a very small stretch of beach. It just won't work. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Um, just if this is the first time you've been to a meeting, I just wanted to let you know that um, when we get to that item on the agenda, which is item G1, if somebody pulls it, we'll have some general discussion and debate on it. If you want to hang around and listen to that, you're more than welcome. If you're a basketball fan, I can totally understand if you don't. <laughs> so thank you for those comments. Um, next is, and I cannot read this name, D. McKinley? Okay, so, so, Ditto, okay, so if the, if the minutes can show ditto, that would be wonderful. Thank you very much. So that's the end of open forum. So next we have the uh, approval of the agenda. We did have some walk-on items and, uh, and I do appreciate um, that council does not like having walk-on items, but some of them are uh, time sensitive. Uh, Mr. Rayner. Your Worship, members of council, since uh, we have so many walk-on items, uh, what, what's, what's one more? Um, I just wonder if we uh, could add an H4 uh, to address a resolution of council to uh, consider an exemption to the code of conduct to allow the mayor and the deputy mayor uh, and the CAO, I'm sorry, it's there. It's already thank you. on That's, there, C1. Thank you, sorry, thank <laughs> you. okay, thank you. Um, so we've got three exemptions and we need a mover in us, or three uh, additions and we needed a mover and a seconder for those items. Uh, counts, are you moving and seconding? So Councillor Waters and Councillor Van Berkel, uh, any comments or questions regarding these three items? Seeing none, oh, Councillor Nickel. I'm just wondering about the item C1, obviously we haven't had any information on this. I'm curious if it'll come out or be, uh, when it comes through, it'll be a little more transparent or a little more Yes, there'll be, Thank you. there'll be lots of lots of discussion and, and we'll make sure that that um, is fully explained at the time. Okay, all in favor? Opposed? That's carried. Uh, disclosure of interest, 
Seeing none now, if one becomes a parent, please uh, indicate. And next is presentations. And our first presentation is from the CEO of Lake Simcoe Region Conservation Authority, Mr. Mike Walters. Welcome again, Mr. Walters. Always uh, good to see you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, Deputy Mayor, members of council, staff, and members of the audience, it's my great pleasure to be here to present the uh, priorities for 2019. Uh, these are our annual priorities. And just to remind you what uh, they entail, uh, annual priorities are associated with our strategic plan or they're significant enough priorities that they uh, warrant uh, uh, being discussed in, in greater detail with the board of directors. We have 11 uh, AOP items uh, for 2019, and I'm happy to say that uh, we'll only have one more left uh, as part of the strategic plan for next year. Some of these are multi-year items, so it doesn't mean we're only doing one uh, AOP next year, but uh, um, we're gonna be done our strategic plan. It had 42 activities, four goals, and eight outcomes. So we're really pleased to see that we're on budget and on time with completing that. These AOP items are opportunistic. Some of them uh, do come up. Uh, could be something to do with funding. It could be something to do with a, uh, uh, an issue or a pressure. And as I've said, some of these can span years. So I'm gonna go through them uh, relatively quickly. I, I know I'm standing between you and the, the basketball game. So we have 11, as I mentioned, these are the 11. I'm gonna walk through them all very quickly. Uh, first is emergency mapping and flood relief. Uh, we've been doing uh, flood warning and, and, and hazard management for, for more than uh, uh, 50 years. Um, this is a little different. This is looking at actually providing opportunities where we can actually go out and reduce floodplain. So we've been redoing our mapping across the watershed. And as we do that, we're actually identifying opportunities to reduce flooding, uh, take people out of harm's way, um, allow uh, areas to be developed uh, that previously might not have been, been, been developed. Uh, we're developing a capital strategy. We're gonna be identifying these areas, looking at what the costs would be associated with undertaking them, what the benefits would be uh, from an elimination of loss of life, destruction of property and social disruption. And we'll be coming up with a shopping list of activities. Uh, this is a, a fourth quarter item in 2020. Uh, one of the other bigger issues that we faced within our watershed is we are one of the most uh, uh, largest areas of growth within the province. And sediment erosion control is a real issue. Uh, um, we are looking at uh, revising our standards right now for sediment erosion control. We're, we're working with the Canadian uh, Standards Association and we've just uh, published some new guidelines. They're gonna be adopted uh, into our policy uh, before the middle of this year. And we're working with the building, uh, build, which is a building land development industry and uh, uh, people like ResCon and our municipal partners. Uh, we're gonna be looking at increasing inspections and potentially looking at a, a, a cost share program whereby we could provide uh, um, some municipalities uh, inspection as part of a fee-for-service program. This is a first quarter deliverable uh, for 2020. We are uh, leaders in what I call low impact development and we're gonna continue to work with our industry and building partners uh, to, to essentially make sure that new development is as sustainable as possible. Uh, we also have the job of making sure that the development that has occurred is addressed and that there are any issues associated with uh, stormwater runoff or flooding, uh, again, can be fixed. Uh, we're doing this through uh, a two-step process. One is uh, we're looking at our guidelines again with respect to low impact development, but more we're working with the stakeholders, undertaking training not only on design, but on uh, how you maintain uh, a low impact development. This is a second quarter deliverable in 2020. Uh, key environmental trends and change. Uh, we do this annually, but we don't produce reports all the time. Uh, they're usually once every five years. Um, we've decided that that's not enough with respect to the reporting frequency. And so we're moving to a new process of uh, publishing key performance indicators on the web uh, site that we have so that people can actually see real time what is changing across the watershed. This is really important because it informs our management decisions. We don't collect information uh, for academic purposes, it's all applied. So if we're collecting information, we're using it for something. Uh, information is readily available on our website. Uh, we have an open data portal and it uh, receives a lot of attention from uh, universities, from the industry, and from our municipal partners. Uh, we're gonna continue to do that, but we're also looking at uh, publishing these key performance indicators and having a new uh, web page all on just the key performance indicators. The example is SALT, uh, which I've, I've mentioned in the past, and uh, uh, it's a significant issue in our watershed. The blue line is uh, showing the SALT increase in Lake Simcoe, 
If we don't do something in 56 years, we'll be at chronic toxic levels for salt. Uh, there is work underway, but I, I won't go into that uh, at this time. Climate change, both mitigation and adaptation are both really important. Uh, mitigation is where you're actually trying to reduce climate change by uh, uh, reducing uh, the carbon footprint. Uh, we have our own carbon resiliency program and we're working with a number of academic institutes to build a carbon uh, balance for the entire watershed and then we can actually look at what we can do to restore carbon balance or actually improve uh, carbon sink. Uh, adaptation is our reaction to climate change and climate change is real folks, uh, it's really happening. We're seeing everything from droughts one year to uh, extreme rain events. Um, storms, uh, and, and our, our one in 100 year event, which was a storm that would only happen one, every 100 years, now happens every 10 and a half years. So those frequencies increase. It doesn't mean we're gonna see more uh, larger flooding, but we're gonna see a frequency and increase in these uh, small flood events. So uh, the adaptation strategy is uh, scheduled for completion uh, before the end of this year. The mitigation strategy is the first quarter deliverable in 2020. Uh, currently, it just so happens I'm doing an operational review of all our 30 programs and services. It was part of a four-year cycle that uh, helps us inform our strategic planning process. Our strategic plan is five years, it ends next year. Um, the program and services review will help uh, inform what we're gonna be doing uh, moving forward, uh, but we'll also be coming out to our member municipalities uh, and, and asking you uh, what programs and services you value. This is actually intrinsically linked to Bill 108. Um, right now the province is looking at what we're doing and how we're doing it. So this was very timely. It was, uh, wasn't planned. We didn't read the province's mind, but uh, it certainly is convenient uh, that it's happening at the same time. So this is a first quarter deliverable in 2020. Uh, asset management is a, a continuing uh, problem risk pressure for us. Uh, we're just finally completing an asset management plan. Uh, if you don't manage your assets, what happens in the picture happens, uh, your boat sinks. Um, this was an old, old boat and uh, unfortunately it was past its life cycle. Uh, we did replace it uh, finally with uh, uh, donations from our foundation. This did not cost our municipal partners any money, which was the good news. Uh, we are completing a financial plan for asset management. Uh, we were able to get some money with the assistance of York Region and uh, the Federation of Canadian Municipalities through FCM. And this is a fourth quarter deliverable in 2020. Talent management is our asset management for people. And I have a great team at the Conservation Authority. We need to maintain that team. And one of the ways of doing that is providing a, a talent management training, as well as developing a successional plan. Everybody has a best before date. And you wanna make sure that if your date comes up, you've got somebody in place that will uh, take over. So we're working on a successional plan. That's a first quarter deliverable uh, first of next year. Uh, also, a provincial priority and something that we had planned to do and we're already doing. Uh, we're working with the build industry, the Ontario Housing uh, uh, and Business Association, ResCon, which is a residential construction group, to look at ways on how we can improve efficiencies for our plan review and for permitting. Uh, right now, we're working with ResCon on an e-permitting system. It's a draft system at this point, and we'll be trying to trial it, uh, hopefully, before the end of this year. But we're looking at reducing our timelines with respect to our review of development and our issuance of permits. And uh, through the e-permitting process, people can always see where their permit is in the process, which is uh, half the battle uh, when you're, you're waiting on a permit, uh, uh, wanting to start construction. Uh, the outcome is a more satisfied client and uh, um, we meet regularly with the build industry, um, at least quarterly, uh, a little more than that right now. And we're making sure that uh, they're pleased with the service that we're providing. So this is an estimated first quarter deliverable in 2020. I'm very happy to say that the Scanlon Creek Operation Center renovation is finally proceeding. Uh, it's taken some time to get it going. Uh, it was, uh, again, uh, we were busting at the seams with our, our office. We had uh, repurposed this building to offices, but it wasn't really well suited for offices. It was an old residential center um, that we used uh, for overnight stays for uh, kids. Uh, this is going to eliminate any current crowding we have, and it'll also uh, allow us to do some storage for our file system, which currently is off-site, and that also allows if there is any future growth uh, for, for the, uh, those areas to be developed. So it's, it's underway now. We're hoping it will be completed by the end of this year, and that staff will be moving in the first of next year. And finally, uh, fundraising construction of a new uh, nature center education center. 
Uh, this is the current center. It's at Scanlon Creek as well. Uh, it is extremely old and past its life cycle. There's three portables that were 20 years old by the time we got them from the York Region School Board 20 years ago. Um, they are in a bad state of disrepair. Uh, we just relocated a family of raccoons uh, out of one of the uh, classrooms. It's not the kind of habitat we're normally used to building. Um, we wanted to make sure that uh, uh, the kids are in there, not the, the wildlife. Um, we're hoping to have everything uh, ready by 2021, funding dependent. We're currently doing fundraising and uh, we're in what is called the quiet phase and I'm not a fundraiser, so uh, don't ask me the difference between a quiet phase and a loud phase. Uh, but um, there is uh, some significant revenue being raised uh, within the watershed and we're hopeful that uh, we'll have all the funding in place uh, and the approvals uh, by 2021 so we can start construction. So with that, I've given you a very quick overview of the AOP items. I also brought along tonight the 2019 approved budget uh, document, which uh, was approved at our last board meeting and the budget companion document. And this is an important document. It talks about our programs and services, what we're doing in 2019, what the outcomes will be. So you can actually uh, take this at, uh, when I come in the, the next year when I'm talking budget, and you can actually ask me, did you get all of this done? Uh, we're an accountable agency. This is part of making sure that uh, what we do is open and transparent, uh, not only to our member municipalities, but to the public as well. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Walters. Questions or comments? Councillor Waters. Can you give us some uh, feedback in terms of uh, your interpretation of what the province is doing and what impact that might have on uh, future operations and some of the uh, revenues that you've lost? Uh, so through your, through your worship, uh, we've lost uh, half of the revenue for the uh, transfer payment for the flood file. Uh, it was about $69,000. It, it didn't translate into a large hit for us um, because we're a $21 million budget. Um, it did for some of the smaller authorities and, and that was uh, a tragic for them. Uh, they're really struggling. We're not reducing our services. We're looking for efficiencies internally uh, to take up that money. We're not gonna be coming back to our municipal partners and saying we need more money for flood relief. Um, all of the projects that you've seen, uh, and uh, certainly the EMS project, is currently within the budget framework that we have for 2019, and it will be able to be maintained in 2020 through some uh, uh, innovation. Thank you. Thank you, uh, and I also want to thank Councillor Waters for uh, being on the board of directors and representing Innisfil well on that committee. Um, the, the, um, the sodium line is a bit scary and uh, certainly we're going to have to put our heads together to do what we can to reduce that impact on like Simcoe. I know that we already, uh, and Mr. Inwood could um, talk further on this, but we already do uh, a, a different salt sand um, compound than say our, our neighbour to the north in order to uh, have less impact. But uh, we can, we'll certainly have to have more conversation about that. Uh, through your worship, it isn't the municipalities that you're doing a good job. I wanna make that clear. You have salt management plans. It's mostly private enterprise and uh, the big malls and the shopping stores and the plazas. And there is a, a freshwater round table and I'm really happy to say that a lot of progress has been made. There is a, a discussion paper that's being presented to the province which would look at best management practices for salt application, and then regulation that would indemnify people should they follow those best management practices. So the real issue is people being sued because of trip slips and falls. If we can get past that, then the industry will stop applying as much salt as they do. And uh, for example, we have one mall uh, in Aurora that spreads as much salt as the entire town does on their streets. So um, we, we need to see that stop. So you're absolutely right. Thank you for that. You. Mr. Rayner. Thank you, Worship. Members of Council, I just wanted to take the opportunity uh, to thank Mr. Walters uh, for his leadership. Uh, as you know, I believe it was the last Council meeting we updated you on uh, some successful uh, flooding uh, mitigation grant uh, uh, application that uh, was really thanks to Mr. Walters uh, and his team uh, who were able to apply for that in uh, the, can we call it mayhem of the election season, um, and made sure that we got uh, our foot in that door. And we've had a recent kickoff meeting, and uh, that, that work is well 
well underway and, and, and great thanks to, uh, to Mr. Walter's leadership. So uh, thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Thank you, Worship. Okay. Thank, thank you. you very much. So uh, mover and a seconder to um, receive the presentation with thanks from Mr. Walters, Councillor Waters, Councillor uh, Deputy Mayor Davidson, all those in favor, those opposed, that's carried. Thank you, sir. Our next item is the Simcoe County Affordable Housing Update. And Mr. Um, Connell, whenever you're ready, sir. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor Dolan, members of council. Um, thank you for this opportunity uh, for myself and uh, Arvona Zviers, the Director of Social Housing at the county, to come and give you an update on our community 10-year affordable housing and homelessness prevention strategy. So uh, tonight's presentation will uh, give you some highlights from the last couple of years, a look at affordable housing progress specific to Innisfil, um, talk about our implementation plan and some municipal tools and planning incentives to uh, support affordable housing. There is a need for affordable housing right across the continuum from homelessness uh, through rental to uh, market home ownership. Um, if, uh, like myself, you have uh, young adult sons and daughters, um, you'll know the challenges that they face these days uh, as they go out looking for affordable accommodation, and that's just uh, one facet of the need. In 2010, the province of Ontario introduced its own long-term affordable housing strategy, and that contained a requirement for service managers, which in this area would be the county of Simcoe, to develop 10-year housing and homelessness plans. So uh, in 2014, County Council approved our plan. Um, it includes a target to create 2,685 new units over 10 years. It's broken down into three implementation planning phases. Uh, we have to report annually to the province and the general public. And uh, we're also to conduct a five-year review, which would be this year uh, on the strategy. So with the uh, in, um, introduction of uh, the county's 10-year plan, a new committee of council was struck, the Affordable Housing Advisory Committee. That comprises six elected representatives from north, south, east, and west of the county, as well as Barry and Aurelia, and also six uh, non-elected representatives who represent the private health and community sectors. Uh, as well, uh, a municipal liaison group was struck, um, and I actually see I'm wearing the same jacket that I was when that photograph was taken. Um, that's mainly uh, planning staff from the different municipalities across the county who meet quarterly to look at ways to move the strategy forward at the local level. And uh, from the town of Innisfil, I don't think he's in that photo, but Paul Pentekinen has been a, a regular attendee, uh, as well as we've had Sam Hanif. This graphic shows um, progress uh, last year uh, in creating new units under the strategy. So you can see that 271 units were created in 2018. That's through a variety of sources. Um, largest number would be secondary suites, also rent supplements to help people pay their rents, um, some uh, affordable rental developments, and some home ownership down payment assistance. As well, County Council approved nearly $13 million for a new 41-unit uh, rental build in Victoria Harbour and $500,000 for a, a new annual age-friendly seniors housing grant program that will provide funding to homeowners or developers to make age-friendly adaptations and enhancements in their buildings. Uh, this shows the uh, progress in creation of units since the inception of the strategy. So as of December 2018, 1,288 units had been created through those various combinations that I mentioned. That represents 48% of the overall strategy target. This information and uh, more updated information will be published in our 2018 annual report, which is due to be approved by council in a few weeks. So the information packages that we've left with you contain last year's report. Uh, the new one will be available uh, on the web uh, before the end of June. In terms of affordable housing progress specific to Innisville, the median household income in 2018 was just under $88,000. 
the affordable house price translated to $329,000. That doesn't mean that there's a lot of inventory at that price point. It means that's what would be affordable to a household with median income. The average market rent for a one-bed was uh, $1,141. For a two-bed, $1,331. The target for Innisfil over the 10-year horizon is 224 units, of which 30 had been created as of the end of last year through rent supplements, down payment assistance, and secondary suites. As well, 61 units were maintained or made accessible through something called the Ontario Renovates Program. There are a number of uh, current and recent rental developments shown on the screen there. Um, three by private proponents using federal provincial funds and three by Simcoe County Housing Corporation. So you'll see the, the second one from the top there is uh, the new development here in the town of Innisfil, 55 units by a private uh, developer down on Innisfil Beach Road. Uh, the County of Simcoe is also um, involved in uh, a large redevelopment in Collingwood that will create 147 units in two buildings. First building's already open, and the second one is due to open uh, later this summer. Then there's a 99-unit apartment building going on in Wasega Beach on land donated by the town of Wasega. And uh, as I'd mentioned, the 41-unit apartment building that's going to get started this summer in Victoria Harbor on land donated by the township of Tay. So this is a, a couple of photographs of the uh, development here on Innisfil Beach Road. Um, in the early days of this project, uh, I worked with uh, Tim Kane from your planning department, so it's, it's good to see it finally completed. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't manage to get an up-to-date external shot there for you. This one was taken in March, so it, it does look a lot nicer now. Um, it's comprised of uh, 55 uh, units, mainly one bed and mainly targeted at seniors. There's uh, some commercial space on the ground floor and it was built using six million dollars in federal provincial funds, um, also uh, benefited from a rebate of county development charges and the rents in the project will be at 70 percent of the average market rent and they're capped at that level for 20 years. County is also responsible to fund and help coordinate a variety of homelessness prevention programs, such as emergency shelters, a housing first program that seeks to house homeless people as quickly as possible and then provide them with supports to try and ensure success in their tenancies, uh, domiciliary care, which again is accommodation targeted to vulnerable people, uh, transitional housing, housing retention programs that provide rent and utility arrears, um, some home for good capital projects. So this is um, funding that will create supportive housing for homeless people. Uh, one of those was uh, a project called Lucy's Place in Barry, which was a motel conversion project that's just recently opened. And there's another project planned in Irelia, hopefully for later this year. As well, an anti-human trafficking project is being built in Midland. So the previous provincial government did update its own uh, housing strategy a few years ago and then contained a number of policy directives, which we will look to incorporate in, in our refresh this year, subject to any amendments uh, that the new provincial government may introduce. So that would include focusing on uh, ending or reducing homelessness, uh, the needs of indigenous people, and supporting the nonprofit and co-op sector, as well as the private housing market. As I mentioned, our implementation plan is broken down into three phases. Phase one is complete. We're now in phase two, which takes us to the end of 2020. So within that, there's a target to create 895 units. There's also, also a variety of uh, recommendations for action, including working with all levels of government to bring the um, official plans into conformity with the growth plan uh, and continuing with the municipal liaison group uh, as a means to look at moving the strategy forward locally. So to that end, um, the county in conjunction with its stakeholders did develop um, a best practices uh, toolkit of uh, tools and planning incentives that could be used by local municipalities to stimulate affordable housing development. So a fairly comprehensive list you'll see there, it, it could include all or any of these um, or a, a variation thereof, um, things like development charges relief, 
property tax incentives, waiving of planning and building fees, reducing parking requirements, and providing surplus land. At the end of 2017, the federal government introduced its national housing strategy. That's a 10-year, $40 billion plan to create affordable housing, preserve existing social and community housing um, through a broad range of uh, programs and funding sources. One of those is, uh, well, there's two actually. There's two low interest repayable loan programs out there that are available to private or nonprofit groups or municipalities uh, to build affordable rental housing. So going forward, um, there will be further rollout uh, by the federal government of its national housing strategy. The new provincial government has already announced some more funding for affordable housing. And they're both working on something called the Canada Ontario Housing Benefit, which is slated for introduction next spring, which um, we don't have all the details of, but it'll be some sort of portable rent subsidy, uh, presumably for lower income households. Uh, the provincial government just in the past month also released its housing supply action plan. Um, you may have heard of Bill 108 with a number of proposed changes to the Planning Act, the Development Charges Act. Um, the, the stated aim of that plan is to in, uh, increase the supply of housing in general um, with, um, with the assumption that that will also stimulate uh, an increase in affordable housing. Uh, where there's an encouragement to um, increase uh, collaborative planning with the health sector around things such as mental health and addiction services. Uh, working with the Ontario Aboriginal Housing Services on like affordable housing programs, and uh, to con continue the work uh, of engaging with our member municipalities um, to support affordable housing locally. I'd be happy to take any questions or comments. Thank you, Mr. Connell. Questions or comments? Count Councillor Waters. Um, in, in a lot of the text that you have here, I was just wondering, I don't hear, I don't see anything that applies to ongoing operating costs in terms of trying to reduce those. And my interest is around, is there any uh, policies or strategies around making these units more energy efficient and around their sustainability for operating costs? For a minor increase in the development of the building, uh, the operating costs can be dramatically uh, reduced. So I didn't know whether or not, uh, if, if there if you have any, if you had anyone on expertise in terms of who did that for you, or do you plan that into your uh, your your existing structures you're building? Um, under the um, funding programs from the federal and provincial government, such as the one that the development uh, here in Innisfil was built under, um, it did contain um, requirements to uh, target energy efficiency. It wasn't particularly aggressive in the requirements, other than that you had to build to code, and we know that code is getting increasingly it has its energy efficiency requirements. Um, in Simcoe County Housing Corporation builds, we very much do look to build in um, energy efficiencies, particularly with um, simple energy efficiencies in, in getting the building envelope tight and right and use of energy efficient windows and products. Under some of the programs under the National Housing Strategy, there are requirements if you wanted to access their low cost loan programs. Uh, that, that go, I believe, above and beyond the Ontario Building Code uh, in terms of both energy efficiency and accessibility requirements. That obviously adds a premium to the costs, but it is, um, it is something that is targeted under those funding programs. Um, as, sorry, as well, uh, Councillor, just a, a thought. In terms of our social housing portfolio, so I've been focusing on affordable rental, but the social housing, which might have been the old... Ontario housing that the county uh, has inherited and is also run by non-profit and co-op groups. Um, there are um, funding programs for uh, capital repairs and improvements. And again, under those programs, there's usually requirements around energy efficiencies in, in the work that's carried out with funding. And just to follow up, I, I know at the federal level, there's lots of funds available for innovative projects around affordable housing, and so it would, I don't know if, there are, if, if you've looked into those, uh, but they seem to be looking for projects uh, that are innovative around affordable housing and, and include sustainability in those. 
So it might be a way of, of getting that, those upfront costs because I know that often scares away um, uh, people looking at those, but the ongoing reduced costs are, are, are what you're really interested in, when you're, especially when you're looking at people who can't afford the, uh, those utility costs and that kind of stuff. Thank you, Councillor Waters. Just uh, a comment on some of the housing stock that the county deals with is, is really badly in need of upgrades. And so we're constantly approving those capital projects just for things like, like windows that have a huge impact. So new builds, I understand totally, but uh, some of what we've inherited is, is really uh, requires a lot, of, a lot of work in order just to get it uh, to what you'd consider sustainable now. Thank you for that question and, and, that, and that advice. Uh, Councillor Sadi. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, the, I was interested in the slide that was um, uh, indicating the toolkit for municipalities, which is not in here, but we would be able to go on the Simcoe County site to download that, would we? I th so if it's not in there, is it, it in should here? be. It's just a one sheet. Yes, okay. Okay, and uh, just uh, just as a comment, um, I had the uh, the 55 unit affordable housing um, building is in my ward on Inneso Beach Road. I went down there and spoke to many of the residents as they were moving in, and some that had been there for uh, had been in for a week, and they are just thrilled and said that it has changed their life in being able to have a roof over their head that they can afford instead of always having to move every few months to try and, or live with relatives who didn't want that situation. A question when it comes in the city, um, in Toronto, in um, apartment buildings and condos, they have a percentage of the building that is required to be affordable units. Is that determined by the municipality and planning when those buildings are being constructed as to a requirement for so many units to be um, affordable units, or how is that how is that handled? Is that municipal or countywide, or if you could help me out with that? Um, I, I believe it could be done in a, a variety of ways. It could be uh, a requirement of a particular funding agreement that a set number of units be made affordable, or it could be that um, rent supplements are required, that, that the owner of a building is, is required to uh, allow people who are benefiting from rent supplements to live in the building, which will help reduce the rent, but it could also be through um, uh, density bonusing. Now, I, I know, that the, so the Section 37 of the Planning Act, there was density bonusing provisions where, in, in, for example, if you were to you're only allowed to do four stories and then you're allowed to do six, then you have to provide, let's say, affordable housing in return um, or through um, inclusionary zoning, which was uh, a discretionary power that was introduced last year. However, under the new uh, Housing Supply Action Plan, there are changes uh, proposed that would affect both of those particular tools. So um, we'll have to see what direction uh, things go in there. Councillor Isis. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, I just had a question uh, with regards to uh, the social services that uh, residents in our town are, are looking for. Uh, last, Last meeting, uh, this council uh, approved a uh, Innisfil Transit site to the uh, Innisfil Food Bank. Um, the Innisfil Food Bank has seen in increased uh, customers over the last months, and uh, as our town grows, we, we realize that there's more uh, social needs, uh, affordable housing, and, and the like. Uh, is, there, is there a way for us because we don't control the social services uh, as council to get perhaps data on you know the number of our residents that are, are looking for for your services so we, we have a better feel for for uh, for that that need that we we know is there but we don't have a really good uh, statistical numbers on on that Ms. Weirs. 
uh, through you, Your Worship, and thank you for permission to answer the question. Um, <clears throat> we have in social and social and uh, community services division, we have a research team <clears throat> who uh, is able to put together data sheets. And they have put together data sheets on the incidence of need and so on. And that is based on information that comes out of uh, Statistics Canada, largely, but not limited to Statistics Canada. Um, and as a follow-up action item, we could uh, go back to that research team and ask that uh, a, a research page that is based on this area of the county um, be circulated over to you. I know we've, we've they, that team has produced already some research pages. It might be that they are countywide, but focused on, for example, target populations such as seniors or children and youth, or it could be that they are um, focused on areas such as um, north, south, east, and west. But we can follow that up and bring that back over to the attention of your of your staff. Yeah, for me that would be helpful to, you know, we we are aware through our volunteer groups of, of the, that comes with our increased population, the, those, the increased social services and, and just to have a, a good statistical number behind that would, would help us in some of the, uh, the decisions that we make with policies and, and whatnot, so thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ices, and I know from time to time at County Council, we do get reports on, you know, number of, of residents who are on wait lists and, um, and also uh, the Simcoe County, um, Simcoe Muskoka District Health Unit also provides snapshots on residents in, in areas of the health unit and um, that the issues that are along with that, it's on their website and I'm happy to, to direct you to that. Count, uh, Deputy Mayor Davidson. Thank you, Worship. Uh, actually, sitting on County Council, I took a drive a couple of weeks ago to the project on Essen Road with the motel. It looks fan. I know that motel for many years. It looks excellent. And I know that in Simcoe County, there are many motels probably in the same situation that we can look at for housing for uh, youth and for people on the streets. Take a drive by. They did a fantastic job on it. So uh, I know that also County Council has been very generous when we've had a surplus that we've turned around and put it into social housing. It's council, county councils and big, uh, that's a big job that we really look after very well, okay? We take it seriously, thank you. Mr. Rayner. Uh, your worship, members of council, I just wanted to thank uh, the county staff and the county team uh, for their good work uh, in this area and, and very, very pleased to hear that the county is entertaining some innovative approaches to uh, affordable housing. Uh, I can't go into the details just yet because we're still discussing it, but uh, the former warden, Jerry Marshall, has some pretty interesting uh, opportunities uh, that are partnering with uh, corporate social responsibility funds uh, to try to provide more funding uh, that is not government-based, but in fact private-based uh, with uh, limited returns in this area. And so we look forward to continuing uh, those uh, discussions with uh, former uh, warden Marshall and uh, the county staff. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rayner, and thank you very much, Mr. Connell and Ms. Weirs, for being here tonight. It's always good to get that update. Appreciate it very much. So the recommendation is that the presentation be received, and it's received by Councillor Sadi and seconded by Council Deputy Mayor Davidson. All those in favor? That's carried. And our next presentation is from Jody Longlin, Programs Coordinator, who's going to talk to us about the uh, Speak Your Mind Mental Health Summit that we just, um, that we just held, and um, Tammy Botham as well. Thank you for being here, and whenever you're ready. Thank you, Your Worship, uh, Council, residents and staff. Um, we thought we'd take this opportunity to add in um, some of our summer community outreach programs. Um, so uh, Mayor had invited uh, Jody to come and speak, uh, speak about her Speak the Mind a mental health event that happened last Wednesday. Um, so we are gonna first talk about um, our mobile youth center. So last summer, um, we were able to launch a mobile youth center for the community. Um, it was uh, in different areas of our community, uh, Monday to Friday, thank you, um, Monday to Friday um, from 1 till 3 p.m. We had um, lots of youth um, participate um, in our mobile youth center. For those that aren't familiar with it, um, we developed a mobile uh, youth center um, a year and a half ago um, because we didn't want to 
pick a youth area that we were only promoting in that area. So we've got this wonderful trailer that has mobile skate ramps, um, basketball net, um, scooters, gigantic uh, life size games, a uh, variety of other things um, we'll be adding as we go through also. So this year it's very exciting that we're gonna expand our hours. Um, the original um, program was for um, our teens. It did end up um, that we were getting a younger crew out, so we actually thought we would do two time slots, um, one for our, our younger um, generation, and then two, we're hoping for the four to six, uh, six time slot, we would get more of our teenagers out. And we've moved a few of our locations, so our locations are listed there, um, and we will be starting uh, the beginning of July. So there'll be more advertising and social media come out about that, but um, that will be launching shortly. Our other um, outreach program that was um, brought forth in 2017 um, is our Neighborhood Nights. Our Neighborhood Nights is a variety of our uh, departments together going out to the community um, in a non um, staff related um, environment um, and we're out to uh, do games with the children, um, fire um, does a splash um, evening, um, the children get to an opportunity to do uh, the run the hose along with their parents, we've had lots of parents interested in that also. The library brings anything from their electronic games to a variety of other things and again we bring out, uh, leisure services bring out our mobile youth centre. Um, so again we will be launching that um, on June uh, 18th and um, we will be in everybody's backyards. So we try to pick areas that don't typically have our services. Um, so we will start in June with uh, Cookstown. We'll go into Alcona. This year we're going into Big Bay Point, um, back into Guilford, Stroud, and Lafroy. And we also, um, this year, will be partnering with Friday Harbor, and we're working out a few Saturday mornings that we'll be out at that location also. So again, that will be um, Tuesday evenings. Um, dates um, provided there on the screen from 6.30 to 8 p.m. Um, so this year we've uh, launched again the Youth Connect Committee. It's consisting of five young youth, two who were returning from last year. Um, they were an essential part last year of our um, Youth Mental Health Summit, and again, we're uh, essential part this year. Um, they helped with advertising, marketing, as well as set up and take down of the Speak Your Mind event. Um, they're very eager youth that um, when we first met had a whole lot of ideas and brainstorming that they wanted to bring to our community. We're finally nailing down our special event that we're actually going to be um, launching out next week. We're just waiting on one final permit and then I can provide more information about that. Um, so the other reason why we're here, um, so last year was our first year offering the Youth Mental Health Summit. We had, with facilitators and youth, just over 100 um, participants at the summit. Last year, I'm, or sorry, last week, I'm happy to report that we had 200, just over 200 youth attend the event, and we had just over 30 facilitators, supports, and teachers. So over 230 participants at the event. Um, they ranged from anywhere from, we had Gravenhurst, we had Bracebridge, um, Tiny was there, Midland, Barry, Innisfil, we had um, participants from Alliston. So it was a huge event that covered Simcoe as well as Muskoka. It was in partnership with the YMCA Simcoe Muskoka. Um, we had two keynote speakers, um, which were very fantastic young youth. Um, they were both athletes, so the first one was Connor Crisps from Alliston, Ontario, who played professional hockey. He, at 24, had to retire from professional hockey because he had suffered too many concussions. But along with those concussions, he um, was isolated from his team because he was injured, he couldn't travel with them. So he made the very hard decision to decide to retire. So he, dealt with, he battled a lot of mental health issues trying to transition back into a small town with a lot of expectations that he was going to be a pro athlete. Um, so he was there to speak to the youth, as well as Gabby Daleman, who is an Olympic gold medalist in the team figure skating event at the last Olympics. Um, she's a young lady um, who's dealt with a lot of mental health issues as well between ADHD, eating disorders, 
um, depression, anxiety. She actually just recently took some time off competitive skating to deal with her mental health. Um, but then decided she was going to battle back and came back to compete. And so stepping on the ice was just a huge win for her, aside from coming 11th at Worlds again. So those were our two note speakers. So the day also consisted of workshops. And at the workshop, some of the um, topics were men's mental health, transitioning from post-secondary into, or sorry, from high school into post-secondary or with the workforce. There was yoga, meditation, um, LGBTQ, um, a whole wide, of, wide range of workshops. Um, the workshops were exclusive to the youth. Um, unfortunately, we didn't allow the facilitators, supporters, teachers, parents, guardians that were there to participate in the workshops, but that was to allow the youth to actually be able to speak their mind, speak out, and get what they need from that without having to have parental or teachers around. Um, and then we, um, we did a Kahoot, and it, the day was just filled with a lot of youth. Um, so my next slide is just some clips and some highlights from the day. So that one clip um, where you've seen the participants with some drumsticks, so that was their giveaway. They were all given a set of drumsticks and they all participated as well as facilitators if they chose in a pound class. So it's a stress release, it's a coping mechanism and it's just one way to um, exercise at the same time but you're also doing things as you're drumming. Um, so that was kind of the, the ending to the day. Um, Thank you very much, both of you, for that. Um, it was an amazing uh, day, and uh, I can tell how passionate you both are about it, and uh, what, a, what a success for our community and for those kids. Um, and it was, it was just wonderful. And as far as the neighborhood nights, if we could ask the press that is here to, uh, um, to, to make sure we push that out. We had uh, several people um, last year, we, we mailed out to every resident, got something in the mail with the dates, and yet, you know, it still went in the day after, oh, how come I didn't know about it? So uh, we'll, we'll keep pushing to make sure that people are aware. Questions or comments from council? Thank you very much. I just wanted to, uh, just on the um, Speak Your Mind, also um, the partnership with the Y was very important. It was really nice of the Ennisville firefighters to come out and cook the lunch too. So it was great. I think the kids enjoyed it. So the recommendation is that the presentation be received with thanks. And it's moved by Councillor Nickel and seconded by Councillor Van Berkel. All those in favor? That is carried. Thank you very much. Next is our delegations, and our first delegation is from our Innisfil Farmers Market. So please uh, come to the podium and look forward to hearing this. Uh, Your Worship, 
Deputy Mayor, Council Members, Staff, uh, thank you for the opportunity to be able to uh, come to you this evening. Uh, it's a very uh, opportune uh, time due to tomorrow being our uh, ninth year of operation. And uh, I think, I don't want to jinx anything, but I think weather is on our side and I'm sure there's a couple of you up there who are uh, hoping and praying that it's going to be warm enough for uh, the dunk tank that you will be sitting in and on. Um, <clears throat> for those of you who do not know who I am, I'm Rob Radcliffe and I am the uh, co-chair of the Innisfil Farmers Market. Uh, I own a, uh, a greenhouse and garden center operation with my family in Lafroy, and uh, this coming September will be our 40th year in operation in Innisfil. And um, I know the farmer's market me means a, a huge amount to our business. It's a, a major part of our business. Um, moving forward, uh, just uh, we want to thank the council for all their uh, support that they've given to us over the last nine years. And uh, I know last year it was the first year of uh, kind of separating and, and uh, governing ourselves, but we still can't do uh, what we do without the support that we get from uh, council and staff. The operations staff is absolutely incredible. Uh, kudos goes out to many of them. Uh, Nikki Bayless is one in particular because no matter what issues or problems we have, a text or a phone call or an email and, and stuff is taken care of uh, pretty quick. Uh, we thank you for the t uh, space that's provided uh, that we kind of are now looking at a, a permanent location there. Um, we've received uh, Picnic tables from you guys, which uh, we've painted up. We are now uh, getting sponsorship from uh, local businesses. Uh, so we're putting up uh, umbrellas. So the market becomes a, a family event, as well as coming to uh, get uh, local produce and, and baked goods and whatnot on a weekly basis. Um, so again, we thank you for the relationship that we have with the town and, and for your continued support. Um, we don't want to forget that with tomorrow's event, uh, there will be fundraising that will go towards the food bank. Um, we, a lot of our events, uh, we have the fire department there with us. We've had Empower, we've had uh, service groups like Rotary with us, and it's a great way for the uh, local residents to be able to connect, not just with the farmers or the bakers or the other vendors, but also with, with what the uh, town uh, can provide. And now I'll pass it on to another part of our committee. <laughs> uh, Your Worship, uh, uh, Deputy Mayor, Councillors, Staff. Uh, my name is Brian Scott. I'm a uh, commercial beekeeper in Innisfil. Uh, my family and I operate about 800 beehives in Simcoe County, York, and Durham regions. Um, I'm also the treasurer of the farmer's market. And the, uh, I do the social media and the website updating. Um, our partnership with the town has allowed us to build a, a vibrant market. I think that's uh, very uh, based very well in, uh, on community, um, and we try to promote community as much as we can. Um, this year, we'll have over 85 vendors um, on event days and through our, our normal uh, days this year. Um, we've actually had to turn away vendors this year that applied. Uh, because the word's getting out that we're a good market um, and you can make money there if you show up. So uh, we get a lot of vendors applying, which, which allowed us to be a little more picky than we've normally been and picking vendors that will build a market that will make people want to come to us. Um, the, uh, we're also, the market is on uh, the Simcoe County Honey Trail. Simcoe County Tourism has, has developed the Honey Trail. Uh, myself, the farmer's market, and uh, a couple other local beekeepers are on that market, are on that honey trail map. Um, and the Simcoe County Tourism will be promoting that map throughout Ontario, trying to drive more people to uh, hopefully Innisfil and, and spend money in our community. Um, I would like to thank uh, the town uh, for the grant we received last year. Um, the money was uh, greatly needed and used quite wisely um, with staff recommendations. Um, and uh, we kept within budget, which was nice. Um, and uh, we're looking forward to hopefully getting the same amount this year as uh, recommended by the staff report that's been submitted. 
Um, I'd also like to thank uh, Madam Mayor um, and the councillors and town staff that have uh, volunteered to open the market tomorrow. You're quite brave. Um, the water's going to be cold. <laughs> Um, we have a lot of people, I think, lining up to dunk a few people <laughs> on the podium there. Uh, thank you. Thank you. It doesn't help the tax bills just came out when we agree to sit in a dunk tank. I don't know what I was thinking. That's called timing. Not looking forward to that. I am looking forward to the butter tarts, however. So just for anybody who doesn't know, the market is at the, in the south parking lot of the uh, YMCA, and it's open at 1 until 6 every Thursday, rain or shine, and, that, and it goes till, I think, the week before Christmas. So, or two weeks, I don't know, somewhere near Christmas. So it's, uh, it's great. Uh, make it part of your routine. Uh, you won't regret it. Comments or questions from Council? Council Arcetti. Thank you, Your Worship, and thank you. Uh, congratulations on the success of the market. It's, it's nice to be able to go there and, and shop locally. Um, uh, just one thing, I know that you've been moved to the, the south uh, uh, parking lot, and that's your setup. Uh, the Rib Fest is coming up. I know that they uh, start setting up on Thursday on that week. Are you moving to the north lot? or? We go to, so the, to the, the Empower. Empower. In power. Power. And so will that be publicized so people know where to go? Can we get that communication out in the town? Great. And one other question that I, I have you may be able to answer. Um, we have a report um, from the, uh, the Farmer's Market Update. And when I was looking, reading the report, it talked about um, the data of people coming. Um, previously, there, it used to be 21% uh, of the people attending and using the market were from Barrie, 62% from Innisfil, 17% were tourists. However, recently, it's been 61% from Barrie, and Innisfil's dropped down from 62% to 19% attendance. Is it, do you think it has anything to do with the time change because we're a commuter town, or any we, comments on that? Yeah, we, we just switched the time. This will be the first year going from uh, starting at one going to six. Um, the, uh, the timing was decided on because uh, most people don't show up between six and seven. So I don't think it's because of the being commuter town that way. Um, I think just because there's more advertising and the population of Barrie is as large as it is and they drive right by, that's why there's such a large percentage um, coming from Barrie mm -hmm. um, because they are our customer. Yeah. There, there's just so much of them and they drive by. But the decline from Innisfil? Any? I think I don't know if it's a decline or we're just getting that many more okay. customers oh, from yeah. Barry. So okay. because Barry skews the larger, percentage. Right. Yeah. 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 Okay, Skewing thank that. you. And, and also the time starting at one o'clock also uh, helps out the town staff because many of them, when we opened at two, could not take part in the market because uh, we weren't open during their lunch hour. So this is more convenient for them as well. Thank you very much. Um, so thanks for being here tonight, and we'll see you tomorrow. Thank you very much. Thank you. So the uh, recommendation is the delegation from the Farmers Market Committee be received. Oh, I'm sorry, Councillor Ices, you had your hand up. I apologize. No, thank you, Worship. It was just uh, as, a, as a fellow farmer, I, I just wanted to congratulate you in, in the great work that you've done in the town. and not only uh, contributing to the rural part of, of Innisfil, but uh, also adding to the, the community and, and uh, uh, making us uh, you know, attractive to the neighbor to come and buy our food. So how, how good is that? So <laughs> thank you. Thank you, I apologize, councillors. So uh, moved by Councillor Ices <laughs> and seconded by Councillor Sadi. All those in favor, that's carried. So uh, next we have uh, Dr. Carolyn Allen, who's going to talk to us about train whistles. Welcome, Ms. Allen. Thank you for being with us. So I'm talking today about train horns and the 
detrimental effect on public health. And you might not think there is a detrimental effect on public health, but it's noise pollution and it's extremely loud. They call it whistling, but it's a misnomer. Whistling went out in the 50s when we got rid of steam trains. Air horns, which is what they use today, produce 110 to 150 decibels of sound. A loud rock band produces 125 decibels. Train horns are required to begin blasting 15 to 20 seconds before hitting the intersection at a crossing, and they are in, to blast two, two longs, one short and a long, all through the intersection, which seems to be a bit of overkill since if you're in the intersection, blasting a horn at you isn't going to do any good. A steam train whistle sounded once. The decibel scale is logarithmic. So for every three decibels, the sound is doubled. So you can imagine how loud these train horns are. It's a worldwide concern. There are hundreds of thousands of communities that are complaining about train horns. From California, Australia, Markham, Saskatchewan, and generally go trains in Wilmot Creek, which is near Hamilton, but they're all over the world. They're a real danger. Now, what is the source of the problem? The source of the problem, according to Transport Canada, is that there's too much residential and human habitation next to the railway lines. And because they didn't know, according to their um, new guidelines, enhancing rail safety, they didn't realize that all of the legislation comes from the municipal level, from the go uh, Ontario government, from the provincial level, from the federal level, and nobody really has a handle on how to say how close a residential development should be to the, to the railway lines. They would prefer, according to their document there, a 300 meter buffer zone with no habitations and trees and general um, noise abatement materials. But unfortunately, selling houses, a computer train station is very, very important for people to get to Toronto to work. So, and the, the new subdivisions create taxes for the township. But no buyer who bought a home in Lower Mel Creek, for instance, would ever know that the trains, what the trains were actually going to do because they sold the houses only on the weekend. So that no one could possibly realize that at 5.22 in the morning, you would get 16 blasts of an air horn. And no buyer could possibly know that the traffic is expected to become two tracks. I think council must have known that. And the trains would be coming every 15 minutes. Why blast the horn so much? It's supposed to be for safety. And it's true when you have a crossing on private land or you don't have any other um, safety features. The reality is that routine train horn blasting with a, a, a crossing that has uh, equipped with lights, bells, whistles, and gates, it doesn't make any difference. The best thing to do is to, to provide a horn right at the crossing so that when the train is 10 to 15 seconds out, a horn blasts at the crossing. This is less noisy 
and it's more efficient. Now, they recommend that human behavior is a cause for most of these accidents that happen. And human behavior is either suicide, and they have no idea exactly how much of the problem is suicide because nobody has studied it. The other thing is risk-taking behavior, and I know a little bit about that because in my previous life, I dealt with youth at risk, and we had a lot of youth that did very risky behavior. One, in fact, used to run down the subway in front of the train in order to get some excitement. So you can't stop risk-taking ability or behavior because North America was developed by people with risk-taking ability. Otherwise, they would never have come. So it's something that we have to think about. And Operation Lifesaver is something run by the government that is very good as far as teaching children the dangers of being on the tracks. Causes of accidents, mostly their main track collisions and derailments. Crossing accidents are only 16.5%. And they are, would be prevented if education was provided for the people who use the crossings. And I'm thinking of elementary school right through because people take it for granted that they can just race across and they won't get into any kind of trouble. And most crossing accidents involve intentional disregard. So I'm speaking to you now because the train horn itself is very detrimental to health, especially for elderly and for children. Fetuses and newborn particularly, but younger children and adolescents. For 17 years, I worked as a consultant to psychologists, psychiatrists, medical doctors, childcare workers, teachers, and parents of children in crisis. One in five young people have a mental condition severe enough to seek treatment. And the Washington Post just recently wrote that medical, mental health problems are increasing among the young due to lack of sleep causing depression and anxiety. The World Health Organization has guidelines for nighttime noise. It's best to sleep with the window open and in generally quiet areas that we have around here in the night, noise over 45 decibels should be very limited. Obviously, four blasts of an air horn at the crossing at 110 to 150 decibels is against these guidelines. And the sound levels are in excess of the Ministry of the Environment and Climate Change at the first row of dwellings with exposure to the railway line due to train whistles. The elderly are particularly affected because their, the stimulation during the sleeping hours causes high blood pressure, sleep disturbances, increased motility, cardiovascular disease and strokes, increase in heart rate, and exacerbation of dementia. Now, one might ask why they always put the old age homes at the intersection of two busy streets. And from the Academy of Pediatrics, you can get low birth weight, particularly with female fetuses, hypoxia, which is a deficiency of oxygen, with sudden loud noise exceeding 80 decibels, the increased risk of shortened gestation periods, that's premature births, and effects on normal growth and development. And in the case of SIDS, which is sudden infant death syndrome, a sudden noise and the accompanying hypoxia could certainly uh, contribute, and that needs more study.
Now, Cornell University study on young children and the Journal of Child and Adolescent Behavior, blood pressure changes and increased motility during sleep with disrupt disruption of the sleep stages. As you know, we go through several stages when we sleep, and uh, the deep sleep is where we actually do any healing of the, anything that happens through the day. So you would get daytime sleepiness, problems with sustaining attention, circadian rhythm disorganization leading to endocrine Im imbalance, and that improves or increases your cortisol. And you may have heard that because it causes obesity, cortisol. And it also causes type 2 diabetes. Ms. Allen, I'm sorry to interrupt. Can you tell me how many slides you have left? Because I really want to make sure there's time for questions and answers. Uh, three. Thank you. Adolescents require the most sleep because they're growing fastest. Adults, they generally say they're not affected, but they don't realize they're affected. Their blood pressures go up. They end up with hypertension. And they don't want to admit they're bothered. And they also may take sleep aids, alcohol, or drugs. Now, purchasers were required to sign a release if they were within 300 meters of the rail line. But the train horn carries for thousands of meters. So what can be done? I've written letters to Andrea Corkin at uh, VIA, or Metrolinx, and for the most part, these were ineffective, but she did pass on the one, one, my latest one to the engineers. And some of them have been nice enough to reduce the amount of horn volume and horn duration, because, but others seem to feel it's really fun to just pull on that horn and let it go for a long time. So the lowest horn setting they can produce, according to the law, is 96 decibels, which is significantly less than 110 or 150. So I thought that maybe council could write to the engineers. You would have more um, pull, I guess, than I do and ask that they reduce the intensity and the duration of the honks in the sleeping hours from 11 to 8. Now, I understand that you can have whistle cessation if you improve the crossing itself. I would doubt very much if the Lafroy crossing needed any improvement, and I would doubt that the Alcona would need any. But you look at the row of townhouses at Alcona, and, and there's going to be many, many people affected there. The other thing to do is to produce some noise abatement barriers. Now, in the daytime, when the trains go north, it's not a problem. Everybody's up. There's lots of ambient noise, and, it, and it's not difficult. But in the morning, when the trains are coming south, that blasting is horrible. And while you may not think you're affected by it, you are. So I think something needs to be done for the health of the residents along the line, especially the people in the townhouses who generally are in entry-level houses and have small children. And it's the small children that are most affected. Thank you, Ms. Allen. Is there any questions or comments? Uh, Councillor Nickel? I think it was just a comment, actually, and maybe staff might be able to answer this. Um, uh, train whistling obviously was something that got me in front of council some time ago. Um, Transport Canada dictates the rules, so we can't change those rules unless we go through a sensation study. And rather than having both the town and Metrolinx go through these studies, did we not engage with Metrolinx while they were uh, examining for uh, cessation options, noise abatement, as well as their part of their rail crossing and track twinning study. I understand we were trying to do that. I'm just wondering if we'd expect that info at some point in the near future. Mr. Kane. Through your worship to Councillor Nicol. Yes, that was the staff report that came to Council uh, back in 2017. We have been 
uh, attempting to work with Metrolinx. Uh, obviously, the size of their organization, the number of projects they have has been difficult. Um, we, as recently as today, we've been trying to get an update on those level rail crossing upgrades. The whole idea and the essence of that previous report was to not duplicate what they were doing. So if they were already looking at those crossings, would there be an opportunity for the town to add on to that scope so that um, when those level crossing assessments were done, uh, we could assess what works would be needed for whistle cessation. So we're still pursuing that opportunity to uh, share um, those resources and costs wherever we can uh, and integrate those upgrades when those level crossings are, are being looked at for the expanded rail program. Councillor Waters. Uh, question to staff. Um, What requirements do we have currently for developers when they're building houses within, you know, uh, 400, 500 meters uh, from the way? Are, are they required to put in noise abatement? Uh, and if so, what is it? And can we improve it? Through your worship to Council Waters, yes, there is a requirement um, for developers to include noise abatement. Uh, the town has recently increased its engineering standards to make this abatement uh, more solid, uh, more long lasting, and also the town has made a conscious decision to include those abatement uh, structures as part of our municipal asset program so that uh, previously they were in the personal, uh, they were owned personally by those landowners. When those structures failed, there would be no guarantee to put those structures back up. So uh, the town has um, expanded its responsibilities, taken on those structures in our asset management program and made sure they're built uh, to a higher standard uh, to this day, so we are actively doing that. Uh, with respect to the warning clauses, uh, all of these applications, any application within 300 meters is sent to Metrolinx. Um, you know, the immediate and the most common feedback that we get from Metrolinx is the insertion of a warning clause uh, in those purchase and sale agreements, so new purchasers are advised uh, both of the existing Metrolinx operations as well as the potential for expanded Metrolinx operations, which would uh, increase the noise activity as a result of that expand operation. So uh, we've been working to make that uh, more uh, plain language as well. Um, and we continue to, uh, to try and make improvements to communicate to our residents that way. Other questions? If uh, I may, doc may make a statement. Yes, you may, doctor. A train horn at 500 f meters is 90 decibels. So 300 meters is ridiculous. And if you don't have any trees or any abatement barriers, it's absolutely useless, especially over an open field. Sorry. Thank you, Dr. Allen, for your comments. I, I can tell you this is a, a, a large file. Uh, we've, it's, this is not the first time we've dealt with this issue. Uh, we had a major um, consultation. We had GoTransit come to uh, the Lafroy area, I believe, to do a presentation. Um, we have 11 crossings in Innisfil, and um, as you know by all your research that what Transport Canada requires uh, at each of those crossings in order for us to pass the cessation bylaw, we are working with Metrolinx because of the twinning of the tracks. Why, you know, for us to put in like the, the baffle guards now and do the work, which uh, we asked Barry what what they did um, when they went through their process and I can't remember the exact figure it's in the staff reports but it was about a, it was a hundred thousand dollars or more per crossing and um, and just the thought of spending the money on that now and then having Metrolinx come up with the electrification and doubling the tracks and tearing it all out seemed to be um, a bit uh, foolish so we've left it with planning to and the development team to work with Metrolinx as they're doing this work to see if we can't at the same time do the improvements so we might have the ability uh, sometime in the future to pass that bylaw. Um, Transport Canada is um, uh, and, and Metrolinx they're, they're fairly stringent when we do call and complain like you did about engineers, we get a letter back and we sometimes get an audit. So they'll send someone from Metrolinx up to do an audit at a certain, wherever the complaint was to make sure that the engineers are following the whistle the, or the horn. But as you stated, if, if an engineer, sometimes that can relate to more noise because if the audit says, no, they didn't do a long enough blast, then that engineer gets told that they aren't following proper protocol. So we, 
you know, we know of the issue, we understand the issue, and we, um, we, we don't have an answer right now other than to say that, uh, that we're hoping that we can get the, all of the intersections upgraded because if we pass the bylaw, it's for all of Innisfil. We can't just say just on this, um, just on where this one subdivision is. So we're, um, we're working towards it, but it, it won't be in the near future. It'll be, you know, over time. And there, there's nothing you can do considering that children are our most valuable resource? I, to I totally understand and appreciate all of your research and hard work. Um, and we are the bottom of the totem pole. So uh, Metrolinx uh, answers to the province and of course Transport Canada answers to the federal government. Uh, our, our hands are as tied as, as yours. We have to follow the rules that they set in place for us uh, and, and, and that's our only option. Okay. I thank you for coming out and I, I hope that you've left a, a copy of your research with uh, town staff, the clerk's office, or sent a copy of your presentation so that we can avail ourselves of that when we are talking to Metrolinx. And there should be a, a page with the various health effects on it in, every, in everybody's package. Thank you, doctor. The recommendation is that the delegation regarding effects of train horns be received as information Councillor Nichol and Councillor Van Berkel, all those in favor? That is carried. Next is item seven, which is county council. Um, any updates from municipal associations, conservation authorities, committee updates? Councillor Waters. Uh, just a quick one, and because Mike uh, Walters was here already, he, um, he brought forward the point that was uh, emphasized at our Conservation Authority meeting was the impact of salt over the next 50 years. Um, I can't state emphatically enough how important this is for us to address. Uh, my question is to, uh, one, one item that was brought up is that there was a, uh, a group called Smart About Smart Council and they do training for, uh, for contractors that certify as owners and managers about uh, salt application. And do we require um, a, the, the, the private companies that do our, our properties, do we uh, require them to be certified? And B, do we have any other requirements of private contractors doing private property? Mr. Inwood. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Through you to Councillor Waters. Um, proud to say that uh, when the Smart About Salt program was first launched, Innisfil was the first uh, municipality in Simcoe County uh, to adopt the Smart About Salt principles and mandated as a certification in our contracts for our contracted services. Uh, so it is uh, something that we live by every day uh, and regulate, it's very similar to how we do with our, our salts on our roads. Um, we do not have any um, authority at this point over private contractors on private property, uh, but happy to consult with them if they wished and, and, and share, them, share with them the, the knowledge that we've gained um, through the process of, of working with uh, Smart of Salt. Thank you. Any other comments? County Council? Anyone else? I just have on, on, the, on County Council, there was uh, one thing that I was uh, quite excited about. The um, county has come up with a new waste app. It's... Um, I've downloaded it, I'm just trying to find it. It's called Simco Collects, Simco Collects and uh, it's, it's awesome. It's, it, it's interactive and it allows you to uh, find out where the nearest transfer station or landfill is, what times they're open, uh, if, there's, if there's a special um, pickup in your area, Christmas trees or yard waste or whatever, uh, it'll come up on the app to tell you when that is. If there's a interruption in your collection for some reason, if there's an issue, you'll be told about it based on your address. So it's a wonderful tool to use and I would uh, encourage everybody to download it. It's free. And it is free. 
Thank you. And um, other than that, the um, Accessibility Committee came to our the Simcoe County Trade Show, and they did a wonderful job representing uh, the Innisfil Accessibility Committee. And I think that they were very proud to see how far they had come compared to some of the accessibility committees in, in Simcoe County, which is a mandated legislated committee. And then finally, the Police Services Board I attended, and we're currently um, advertising for uh, a public member of the Police Services Board for any interested uh, people who think that they uh, might like to serve on that entity, um, that the applications are being accepted uh, by the clerk's office. Yes, thank you. Anyone else? Seeing none, then we'll go into the consent item list. So this is where we go through all of the uh, staff reports and the items, the minutes, and uh, we any of, them, any of them that we pull will have further discussion. Any that are not pulled are deemed to be that this, the report that's, uh, the recommendation that's in the report will be deemed to be accepted and we'll accept that as we go into back into <laughs> council at the end of the meeting. So we'll start with item A1, which was the special council meeting dated May the 22nd. A2, the regular council minute, meeting minutes dated May the 22nd. B1, the Innisfil Park Beach Ad Hoc Committee report. Councillor Sadi. Refer to committee. Thank you. B2, the School Zone Traffic Safety Advisory Committee report. Uh, Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Worship. Just a point, I was reading the report about that particular uh, school area and the next one that's coming up. And it seems to be a common denominator. It's the parents who are not abiding by the laws that are currently in place in those school zones. It's parents who are speeding. It's parents who are illegally parking. I think the problem is within our own community and getting the message out to those parents and having bylaw do a blitz. Again, like I said on Israel Betrothed, when they get enough tickets, they, they'll start paying, they'll start listening. That's it, thank you. Thank you, Deputy. Um, item C, standard requests, are, there are none. Item D1, the staff report regarding the 20, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, I missed that. Item C1, um, Mr. Rayner. Thank you, Worship, uh, and members of Council. Uh, and, and I apologize uh, for this uh, being a last minute add-on. Um, I, I received an invitation, um, I think, uh, while I was at the hospital uh, with my son's birth, uh, from uh, one of our developers in the community, the Cortel Group, uh, who have secured a table at the Vaughan Mayor's Gala uh, 2019. Uh, they would like to invite the mayor, the deputy mayor, and uh, myself. Uh, to celebrate uh, that gala with them. Uh, the recent code of conduct that you approved provides for a maximum, and, and the clerk can help me uh, if I misstate this, but uh, a maximum amount per event of $200 for the cost of the ticket. Uh, the cost of the ticket, because it's a fundraiser for various uh, charities in Vaughan, as I understand it, uh, is actually $500 per ticket. Uh, so um, it, it requires uh, a resolution of council to exempt this particular event uh, from the code of conduct, uh, if that's uh, your preference. The staff code of conduct actually provides for uh, delegated authority to the CIO, if I, if I recall correctly, for exemptions on a one-time limited basis for specific uh, events. Um, uh, sometimes we don't control the cost of the events, obviously, but it's important for us to continue to do that municipal networking. Uh, and given the nature of this event being a municipal event, uh, uh, I'm certainly uh, see no concerns from my uh, perspective, uh, but wanted to uh, provide uh, you with the opportunity. And again, I apologize uh, for the uh, last minute notice, but it is, uh, the event is actually next week, uh, June 13th. Thank you, Worship. That better be a pretty nice rubber chicken dinner. <laughs> I'm sorry. I didn't say that. I take that back. <laughs> uh, any comments or questions? 
So, Mr. Rayner, I don't even know whether I'm free that night, so um, I, I can't say, did, does the deputy mayor know if he's free that night? I am free that night. I was made aware of it, but I said that is against our code of conduct, so I haven't replied. So, Your Worship, that's an excellent point. Uh, certainly, um, uh, I'm sure uh, the Cortel group would be pleased if the resolution actually read or designate. Uh, so if, if there were other members of council, for example, that wanted to go uh, in your place or for perhaps another uh, staff member in my place if I'm unable to attend, because uh, that's an excellent point, I, <laughs> I haven't checked. Uh, with your calendars just yet, just received the invitation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Seeing none, all in favor of the ex Excuse. Sorry. Mover and a second. Mover and a seconder. Moved by Councillor Icy, seconded by Deputy Mayor Davidson. And your what worship. else did I forget? Sorry, we because we added it at the approval of the agenda, we added it to the consent list. Um, so Provided no one's objecting or pulling oh, I it, see. Then we'll we, just, don't need we can that. move on to just, the next motion. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. All right. So no one wants to pull item C1. Thank you for the direction, Mr. Clerk. Item D1 was the farmer's market update request for support. Item D2, the uh, field allocation policy, the cross, baseball, Soccer, seeing none. D3, the Carson Village Drainage Award, Carson Creek Improvements. I'd like to pull that one if I could. D4, the approval to expropriate 7335 Young Street. Seeing none. There's no bylaws and there's no correspondence for action. So the correspondence list for information, item G1, the memorandum from uh, Ms. Botham, Councillor Fowler, G2, the town campus walking trail uh, app program application, fingers crossed we'll get some grants, and G3, the council, uh, Declaration for blind, sorry, deaf blind awareness in the town of Innisfil. And G4, the Innisfil Public Library Board minutes from April the 15th. Okay. Next, we have item H1, which is the supplementary item regarding the Innisfil Heights employment area request. Um, Mr. Kane, just a, a question about that. So, or just a, if you want to make a, just a quick comment as to why this is on here might be appropriate. Thank you. Yes, of course, Your Worship. Uh, the, the item tonight is a two part request. So, the first part is essentially reaffirmation of what um, the town has been asking for from the ministry for quite some time. Uh, as you may or may not be aware, the minister is the only person that can change the planning rules for Innisfil Heights. So uh, after a ministerial delegation at AMO uh, in the summer of 2017, um, asking for an expansion to Innisfil Heights to uh, reflect what our employment needs actually are and what our anticipated servicing needs are, uh, we still don't have a resolution to that request uh, as well as the expanded uses of part of that. So um, to assist the new government with understanding our request further, the idea is to reaffirm that previous request that we made. The second part of this stems from council discussion uh, that was held regarding discussions about Bill 108 uh, and the planning changes uh, at the last council meeting. Uh, we heard the desire from council to be proactive in the provincially significant employment area label. Um, certainly that label caught our eye. Um, in the absence of knowing what the details are of that label, um, i.e. the regulations, uh, what we would like is some early direction now from council just to uh, allow us to, um, we don't need your permission to monitor that obviously, but uh, once that comes into play and once we know what those rules are to act quickly on that and put that request in if it gives us more flexibility than our existing request into the ministry. Thank you. Everyone seems satisfied with that. So next is H2, the boat launch fees. And this was an, uh, one of the items that was walked on the floor this evening. 
Any questions or comments on this one? Seeing none, H3, I will pull that one if I could just to provide further explanation on where we're going on, on that one. So now we have the consent list recommendation. I have, thank you very much. So the items, is, is that item correct according to everyone's list? Can I have a mover and a seconder? Moved by Councillor Nichols, seconded by Councillor Van Berkel. All those in favor? That's carried. Now we will resolve into committee the whole with a recommendation from Councillor Fowler and Deputy Mayor Davidson. All those in favor? And that's carried. So the first item is item B1, which uh, Councillor Arsadi uh, referred to committee. And Councillor Study, if I could, just for ease of, of um, going through this recommendation, because it is divided into parts, uh, I wondered if we could deal with each part at a time and, and then, um, you know, first the signage, then the boat launch, and, and then we can kind of keep our comments to that one section and, and as opposed to going all over the recommendations, if that works for you. That does, Your Worship. Um, I'm not looking at jumping all over this. Um, I am, am going to speak about the target area parking and the attached map that Council had um, on this, um, which it may be surprising to people watching because I am the chair of this committee. Um, but uh, when, we, when the committee looked at um, a pilot project of permit parking for residents only uh, within a one or two kilometer area of Innisfil Beach Park. Uh, we took a look at a map. Uh, it included a wide range in my ward three, uh, west of the 25th side road. At the time, I said that I could not support the, the inclusion of the uh, permit parking being put on those streets um, because I I have not in the past five years of, of being a counselor for this ward received complaints about people attending Innisfil Beach Park and parking on those streets. I had a concern for businesses such as lawyers and, and chiropractors that rely on those streets. I've double checked with uh, customer service on their data. They have given out no tickets, no parking tickets uh, for the past year and they have not received calls or complaints in regards to um, non-resident parking impact on those streets. However, with the recommendation that is in this report for that uh, pilot, there's always a consequential impact. And I just want to be prepared that, um, so I have an amendment um, for uh, staff uh, that I'd like to put forward uh, because I'm concerned that the consequential impact of putting non-resident parking on nowhere in all those other streets may push it to these three streets. And if they do, staff will provide that and we would like to add that uh, pilot of no parking onto that. So hopefully that explanation is clear. Do you have a seconder, Councillor? I do, I have Councillor uh, Alex Waters. Thank you. Okay, any questions or comments on the amendment? And that's dealing with the uh, target area parking. Mr. Parkin. Sorry, Your Worship, did we have a mover seconder for the original motion as well? Councillor Saadi and... Councillor Fowler. Fowler. Councillor Fowler. Thank you. So on the amendment... Uh, no, we've got a mover and a seconder already. I just wonder if there's questions or comments. Councillor Ices. So I'm just trying to get my head around the the motion as as a whole. Okay, so, so it, if I'm sorry to interrupt, Councillor, but I, I if, think it re relates to to this to amendment because well. then we're gonna we're gonna vote on them on the motion as a whole. At which point we'll comment on the rest of it. Okay, may just, I'll, I'll wait. To so sorry, but it's procedure. I apologize. 
Um, on the amendment, I'm wondering um, whether if you look on the area of the map to the north, and I know that the uh, Innisfil Beach Park Ad Hoc Committee did have a presentation from a lady who lived on Chestnut who was interested in being in the targeted area as well. So I don't know whether, um, you know, the ward councillor would like to comment on whether Leonard, Chestnut, and the 10th would, should also be included either in the amendment or in the target area. Um, Deputy Mayor Tom. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. I spoke uh, with our traffic analyst um, earlier today, and she had assisted in making this motion for Councillor Sadi, and she included within that, um, uh, where is it, uh, parking related on streets neighboring the target area, including. So this is so that it, they are able to go outside of the target area and include other streets as they start to do their assessment uh, to report back to council, they may uh, go outside of that area as well. Thank you. That's satisfactory. Okay, so any comments on the amendment? All those in favor of the amendment? Uh, Mr. Rayner. So, sorry, Your Worship, uh, I don't want to delay it. I'm just curious if, if uh, Councillor Saudi meant to say that this, re those results should go to the committee first and, and then to, to Council, or if in fact Council is taking this back over from the committee. Because uh, I, I think the concept is you want to know how it goes. And I, so, I think the committee, I, I think, does as well uh, to be able to make any recommendations moving forward. So I just wanted to be clear. Uh, what, what your direction was. Thank you. It looks like I'm getting a nod from the mayor and in guidance, I... Um... Councilor Saad, if you're looking for my opinion, I think that, that, I think the, um, that the, the committee would very much be interested in hearing what those results are. Thank you. So then we need to amend the amendment to report back um, so we're going to have to report to the committee first, and then it'll be a follow-up um, council meeting. Your Worship, members of council, if I, if I could assist, uh, perhaps uh, you would like this report to go back to the committee uh, uh, in August, uh, and then from there you could see what the committee decides to do. Because I, I expect there's probably going to be a more uh, wholesome recommendation about what to do next summer uh, related to those results. Uh, so you may not need a specific report back on this item to council because you get an overarching one. Uh, but certainly at that time you could make the direction uh, for that report to come forward to council specifically if you wanted. Councillor Setti, are you okay? And is your seconder okay with the uh, amendments? I'm just checking amendment? with my seconder. Yes, we're both okay with that. Okay, thank you. All in favor of the amendment as amended. That is carried. And now for the uh, entire motion, Councillor Ices. So, thank you, Your Worship. J just to help me understand on the map, so the, the two kilometer zone, it's the one kilometer zone. Mm -hmm. So if, if I am a resident there and I have somebody visiting me that is not a resident and he parks on the street, he'll get a ticket. Councillor Aces, unless you give them your resident parking pass and they put that on their window. I thought that's what it meant, but I, I just want to be sure. I just, I'm wondering about, about the, uh, there, there would need to be a lot of communication on this, I think, just so everyone in that area would understand. Thank you. I think uh, if the community engagement team is going to be directed to, um, to dive deep, um, I think that the, that the group uh, worked hard to try to find the affected area, um, the homes that have been affected over the over the years, um, and to try to find a solution. When we go out to consult with the residents, they might think this is a really bad idea. We don't know, but um, it was the committee's best um, idea coming forward to see what we could do about um, the unsafe conditions that are created when people park on both sides of the street. Councillor Sadi. Just um, as a follow-up to uh, Councillor Ices, um, 
what I've recommended uh, previously in the uh, Lakelands northern areas um, is that um, if you had guests that were attending, you have your parking permit, you park on the street and let your guests park in your driveway and it seems to resolve it and work. But you know, this is about a pilot and seeing how it works, seeing if it takes the strain off of uh, the, the community and getting the information back. And, um, and the mandate was to, um, to look at the, the pressures on Innocent Beach Park and the, um, the consequential impact on all the residents that uh, live on these surrounding streets. Any other questions or comments on this? Uh, Mr. Inwood. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, just a quick scan on our uh, Rover app, and I can confirm that there's, it looks, just a quick scan, it looks like there's about 45 or 50 spaces within that target range uh, available for folks that are coming to visit um, or if they need overflow parking. Mr. Rayner. Uh, that's excellent, Mr. Enwood. Uh, also, Your Worship, uh, members of Council, I just wanted to be clear about in terms, in terms of the community engagement teams uh, 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 the expectations, today is June 5th, this is to be implemented by June 26th. What that really means is that we'll probably do a direct mail to those residents in this area. That's really the only way we can guarantee that, that we're getting to those people. Um, those costs, I mean, won't be outrageous, but certainly this committee has a budget and that would be the report back from the community engagement. Happy to take your direction otherwise, but I think that's the, the most uh, time sensitive way of addressing this uh, to make sure that those residents are aware. Thank you, Worship. Thank you, and I just wanted to uh, also point out that that was um, one of many recommendations that this group um, is hoping to try as a pilot project. One of the, another one is including uh, more signage, particularly around the, the, the smoke-free park um, and the boat launch, having somebody, um, I don't wanna say babysit, but uh, be at the boat launch to assist people uh, between 8 and 10 a.m. and also the enforcement of the park. I did take the opportunity to speak to the chief about paid duty officer and he said he will uh, he will work with us um, for that first holiday weekend to see if uh, if and then we'll see whether or not that makes a difference and of course that is uh, flexible based on weather so if you know, July 1st is a day like that, or that weekend is a day like this, then I don't, I don't think we'd need a pay duty officer there. So we, we can cancel within 24 hours without any, without any um, cancellation fee. So seeing no other comments, just wanna really thank, this group is meeting bi-weekly and they're working so hard. And it's a real diverse group of people and they're really putting 100% in and, and some have, you know, there's, there's a variety of, of ideas and trying to, to come to a spot that everybody can live with. It's been a lot of work uh, and I hope that, uh, that we get some success out of it. All in favor of the recommendation. Thank you. This uh, is one I pulled and I have no uh, intention to change it. Uh, just I need a seconder and that'd be Councillor Van Berkel. Uh, it's in regards to the Carson Creek Drainage Award and I'm really happy to see this come forward and I wondered if I could ask uh, Mr. Ninehouse if we've had some significant, and I guess and Mr. McKenzie, we've had some significant complaints at the um, Carson's Creek um, in parts of it that have been quite silted this year. And I wondered if some of this bank erosion has been contributing to that, or uh, do we still think it's, um, it might be development? Uh, to you, Your Worship, I, I believe it's, um, this may have a small um, proportion of that sediment, but I think uh, the majority was development earlier in the spring, but we have uh, been working with the developers to tidy that up. Um, but I, I haven't looked for this erosion to see if how much it's contributing, but I'm, I'm, I'm sure it's a small percentage. Thank you. Councillor Van Berkel. 
Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, I did look because I live right there and uh, and actually I own probably about 300 feet along Carson Creek there and it was fairly clear this the last two rains. So I think they've been doing some work. Otherwise I would have complained. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All in favor of the recommendation. That's carried. Next is item G1 and I, Councillor Fowler pulled this one. Um, I'm bringing this up for discussion primarily because of optics in regards to this matter. Uh, I was not aware of the situation as it evolved <clears throat> until I've had a number of residents come and speak to me about this. Um, as it currently stands, Leonard's Beach is a very, very busy place in the summertime with the, with the issues with the parking, with the issues with the garbage. I, oh, I'm sorry, sorry. Did, did you have a recommendation yeah, and did you have a that. mover and a seconder? Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah, thank you. yeah, please. And is the recommendation that it be received as information? Uh, I'm actually going to get some. Inf I want to get some information from Mr. Inwood and uh, Ms. Baltham, if possible, before I actually move thank it forward. You. So uh, the recommendation on the floor right now that you're speaking to is receive as information, and then you can change that on the fly if you need to, Councillor. Okay, perfect. Mr. Rayner, sorry. Uh, your worship members of council certainly happy to provide some more information to council to, as they consider this item uh, mr inwood and mr ba and Ms. Ms. botham pardon me um uh, will be happy to provide more information i think two critical pieces for you to consider one is that this was in place last year so we do have protocols around how this will work uh, i i certainly take the residents uh point and uh about managing this in the early part of the season uh, one of the challenges we always have is that the park and its users uh, look very very differently in early May uh, than they do in July. And part of it is, and I think the resident's quite right, is about managing those expectations, right? So uh, if people are paddle boarding right in front of the beach wherever all the kids are gonna be swimming, we, we've got to communicate that that while that may be possible in early May, it's certainly not possible in early July. Uh, so we certainly take those points, uh, but we have had some experience with this uh, given our, our contract that has been signed uh, with this vendor uh, for this season and for last season. And so there are contract implications if, if you decide to do something else with this tonight. Uh, if you do, I'd invite you to ask staff for a report back uh, before, uh, just so that you can consider those contract implications. Thank you, Worship. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rayner. And I, I believe it was, I could be wrong, and I'm going to ask Ms. Botham to come up to the mic if you don't mind, but I believe it was only Maple View last year. I'm not sure if it was at Leonard's also last year, but I, I, I'm not the expert on that. So yeah. I'm happy to give you some um, thank background you. information, um, Your Worship. Um, in early 2018, um, we, f we finished our pilot um, in Innisfil Beach Park that had a stand-up paddleboard um, company in there. It ended in uh, 2017, so we went back out to the public. And um, because the residents had requested um, additional locations, they felt that they couldn't utilize the stand-up paddle boards on weekends um, in, in a Swill Beach Park because it is so busy. Um, we decided as staff to extend it to uh, the 12th line, uh, Guilford, and the 10th line um, for open vendors, non-motorized. Um, we came back with none for Innisfil Beach Park and this one vendor, the Northern Stand Up Paddle Boards, um, that was interested at the 12th line and the 10th line. Um, because we were under construction at the 10th line last year, he didn't want to encroach on any more of the parklands, so he went at the 12th line only. We did have some um, similar concerns at the beginning of the season. Um, I think the mayor and I answered three, two or three questions. Um, as the season progressed, we monitored it, municipal law monitored it, and we had no other um, resident concerns. Um, a lot of the people that are attending um, this vending is our local residents. Um, yes, he also did services in Barrie, um, but our hopes is that we're going to supply our residents with a new opportunity. Um, as far as last week, um, I know a lot of the residents were noticing that we had quite a few um, paddle boarders. That was training. So um, they had 12 uh, paddle boarders at the location. Yes, they were in closer because they were doing their coaching and their training, and those people were parked in the um, 
a resident parking lot. Um, moving forward, the intention is that he will run um, programming two evenings during the week and two, possibly two mornings, a sunset, um, possibly two mornings of the week. So it's kind of off, um, off time for us as far as those, those parking lots. The weekend intention is rentals only. So the intention is he's going to be renting to the people that are already coming to the park. The intention is not to um, bring additional non-residents or such to that park. It, it is to rent to the existing clientele that's already there, whether they be residents or non-residents. Um, the other concern was the location of um, his setup. Unfortunately, um, due to the wet weather, the intention was to set him up on the south side of the park, um, but we had just laid fresh sod and operations felt that that wasn't the greatest um, location. We didn't want to ruin um, the new sod, so unfortunately we did have to set him up on the north side of the park, um, but the intention is that they will enter in and out of the park on the north side so that they're not um, disturbing the swimmers. Um, and they will be outside that swim area. It is, um, we have sp I've spoke to the vendor. He's quite aware that it'll be outside that, um, that swim area. And, and you know, we're hopes too that we'll push those boaters back that typically get too close to the swimmers. So health and safety is very important to the vendor and um, the town ourselves. Thank you, Councillor Fowler. That pretty much answers all my questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone have a question or comment? Okay. And if residents um, do have concerns, Ms. Botham, and they, they can send a note into customer service and it will go to you? Absolutely. Um, if anybody has any ongoing concerns, please do put them into the inquiry. Um, to customer service will be monitoring throughout the year as we did last year. Um, and also municipal law, we meet with them, um, I meet with them on a weekly basis with Innisfil Beach Park and other park issues. So I'll make sure that they take a special look at that and make sure that we have no ongoing concerns um, and address it as we, we move forward. Thank you very much, Ms. Botham. And I noticed the, the ladies that was spoke earlier are still here. So if you want to take the opportunity, if you have a few minutes, Ms. Yeah. Botham, to maybe speak to them in the, in the hallway and answer any further questions that they might have. Um, if you want to take that opportunity, that's, that's certainly up to you. Thank you. All in favor of the recommendation to receive as information? That's carried. Next is the item H3. Uh, the recommendation is as, uh, on the floor. I uh, need a mover and a seconder. Councillor Ices and Councillor Deputy Mayor Davidson, I believe I um, sent an email to Council about this, but for um, full transparency, I just wanted to speak to it for a moment. The uh, Tollendale 2, if you recall, was a uh, an application that came uh, to us uh, several months ago, actually it might have been the last term of council, that was uh, about building a, a similar um, seniors residence, affordable housing and long-term care uh, that, is, that is on Hearst Drive in Barrie now in, in another location within Innisfil, but on the border of Barrie. Uh, staff had some issues as far as uh, complying with the provincial policy statement, however, council chose to unanimously approve it. Uh, it then went to the next level, uh, which is the County of Simcoe for approval. The county planners had similar concerns as, as our town planners had. Uh, there was a meeting that included um, the, uh, our provincial and federal representatives along with the county in Tollendale and um, the MPP, uh, Andrew Kanjan, um, who was in favor of the project going forward, suggested that she would approach staff at Municipal Affairs and try to come up with a way to um, mitigate the issues, the planning issues that were involved. Um, her, the, her advice to Tollendale is to apply for a ministerial zoning order. 
Uh, it's a fairly heavy-handed tool. It's not used very often, but uh, it has in the past been used. The most recent was Burles Creek Event Park. Uh, was given a ministerial order by Minister Clark not that long ago. So um, the suggestion is that the ministerial order is kind of the cleanest and quickest way uh, for them to move forward. And uh, while they did, don't require council support, they thought it would be appropriate to let the minister know that this council does support um, going in that direction. What I'm particularly pleased about is if it's, if, if it's a ministerial zoning order, it won't be, well, I mean, it won't be easily precedent setting because any other uses uh, surrounding Barrie would have to go through the same process. And, and it's, like I said, it's a tool that's not used that often. So um, I'm sorry to just throw this on at the last minute, but the proponents are anxious to get, uh, to get, in, to get this support letter. So that is why it's been walked on and I appreciate this council's um, consideration of this this evening. So if I could, um, I got a mover in a seconder, didn't I? All in favor? Oh, question, Councillor Nickel. Thank you, Worship. Yeah, actually, I did miss the meeting where this was voted on, so I, I didn't get a chance to speak to it at all then. Um, I'd never heard of this before, so I did look onto it. And according to the province's own webpage, this is a rarely used zoning order, especially where municipalities have existing or don't have existing zoning bylaws. They're used to protect provincial interests, mostly in Northern Ontario where there's no local municipality or zoning bylaw. But we do have zoning bylaws, we do have a local government. And our planning staff and the county staff did oppose this, this location. Um, I'm not gonna sit and argue tonight about it because I think it would be a true benefit to the community. And obviously with support from MP Broussard and MPP Kanjin, it showcases that we all feel the center would be beneficial to the community. But every turn, it seems we're circumventing the rules to try and stuff this into one location. And I really wish there would have been an alternative site for this. I'm not going to fight council on it because the will of council has already spoken. But I just feel that we've, we're, this, this proposal seems to be grasping at straws at, at every angle, trying to just get it into that one spot. And I think it would have been more beneficial here at the campus node or some other spots where, where it could be fully serviced by in services. So that's all I'll say. Thank you for those comments, Councillor. Any other comments? All in favor of the recommendation? Any opposed? One opposed, and that's carried. Thank you. Next, we have a rise recommendation um, moved by Deputy Mayor Davidson and seconded by Councillor Fowler. Rise and report back. All in favor? That is carried. And the recommendations from tonight's committee of the whole adopted as resolutions of council. Moved by Councillor Icy, seconded by Councillor Setti. All those in favor? That's carried. And next we're on to announcements. Anyone have any announcements? That's not an announcement. Okay. Councillor Setti. Sorry, uh, Your Worship, just when you were talking about the Simcoe County app, is uh, there's a good little uh, information on there with the upcoming clothing uh, collection for a Monday, June 24th, and information on that as well. Thank you very much for that. I have a couple of announcements quickly. I just wanted to let you know that last night it was a privilege to attend the Innisfil Lions Charter Night. And, uh, and there was several Lions there that received uh, both attendance awards and, and awards of recognition. They're, they're a small but mighty group. They certainly do uh, a lot of, of work for us. Um, also, the, on June the 12th is the Rotary Flag Raising. and. They're doing that in honor of their 10th anniversary. Ice Corp has got their Rib Fest coming up June 14th to 16th. And the on uh, June 22nd is the 40th anniversary of the Innisfil Garden Club. June the 10th is a concert that's put on by the Innisfil Heart, Arts and Heritage Committee. So, what I'm getting, it's a theme here. There's so many organizations, volunteer organizations in our community that work so hard to do all of these things. And um, we're just so fortunate 
to have so many people who are so um, committed to our community. And other than that, uh, two other items, sorry, three other items. We, uh, tomorrow is the launch of uh, the Drive Safe campaign that South Simcoe Police will be doing at uh, Nantire Shores Secondary School. Tomorrow's the farmer's market for butter tarts and dunk tanks. And also on Friday night, uh, Council will be uh, hosting game four of the, uh, of the Raptors. Uh, here uh, at Town Hall. Uh, we're going to be doing it uh, outside if it's nice, inside if it's not nice. Uh, we looked at several locations. I know there was a lot of people who wanted it at the park, including me, but unfortunately we couldn't guarantee that we would, um, with the internet live streaming, that we would get, um, and I can't imagine if it was near the end of the game and all of a sudden the internet cut out, I don't think I'd wanna be in the park if that happened. So uh, we'll try this, see how it goes. And hopefully when we have our new town square, we'll, have, uh, we'll be nimble enough to be able to host these events at the drop of a bucket because it'll be, we'll have that design built into the town square in order to um, you know, at, at, at a moment's notice come up with, with this type of an event for our, com our community. And he so hearing none, uh, the confirming bylaw is recommended by uh, Deputy Mayor Davidson and Councillor Fowler and the uh, adjournment at 918 by Councillor Nickel and and Councillor Van Burkle. Thank you everybody for your attendance. Thanks for, for being here. Um, congratulations, Mr. Rayner, on your new addition. And have a good evening, everybody. And we'll see you next week for a planning meeting. It's 15-7 for the rafter, by the way. <laughs>